to to everyone about roundabouts. It's it's kind of designed for a wide range audience group, and I I think there's a little bit here for everyone, and we'll try to keep it loose and enjoyable. But um, you know, starting a roundabout project, you know, you you, you want to have communication with everyone involved. Um, you know, your your stakeholders, your your public, your contractors. You know, we're all used to doing signalized intersections or stop control, side street stop control. Everyone's got a pretty good handle on how those work and, and how to construct them. But roundabouts are new. So communication is, is pretty important during the project design process. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. You know, and without communication, you can have negativity from misunderstanding. And this is an, an actual um, cartoon that was in the newspaper at one of the first roundabouts I worked on about 16, 17 years ago. And it, it turned out to be a huge success, but after three or four public information meetings that were not going very well because the community was just not receptive to the roundabout, uh, the local newspaper had published this article and it, it really didn't help our mission any. Um, but it's you know just kind of a good reminder of, about communication during the design and planning process with with everyone um, and, and how the roundabout is intended to operate and the purpose and benefits of roundabout can can really kind of avoid some of this sort of thing. So to be successful, you need a good design, you need a good team, and you need really good public involvement to, to advance your roundabout project much more so than you would with a typical intersection job just keep that in mind much much more so than a typical intersection job and we'll talk about that so your team for the roundabout design is is going to be a little bit more robust than you would typically have for an inter, any simple intersection improvement you really need to gather your elected officials, try to get them behind you, local planning, economic development at the local level is very important because they're the ones they're the ones that are communicating with the business owners that have a pretty strong voice. So you need economic development and planning very clear on the purpose and need for the roundabout and how the roundabout operates. So kind of in the background, they can be a champion for it locally and help it to be a success later at public involvement and through construction. Emergency services, um, very, very important that you have outreach with them, fire, police, ambulance. You want to talk with them so that they have a clear understanding of the purpose of the roundabout, how it operates, maybe why it's the best choice for traffic control for that particular location. You know, these are your partners in getting the job done. And we, we wouldn't typically always reach out to them for just any intersection project, but roundabouts are unique. They're still fairly new in Connecticut and some communities don't have them yet. And, and you, you really need to, to reach out to these groups just to kind of put the, the fires out that might be going with, with people that are unfamiliar with roundabouts or don't like them because they don't understand them. You know, and then of course, you know, public works, your engineering, landscape architects, also very, very important part of the roundabout design team. Make sure they're on board, make sure they they clearly understand how the roundabout's supposed to operate and function. It, it It's not window dressing with landscape architecture on roundabouts. The, the landscaping on a roundabout is functional and it's intended to be part of the safety of the roundabout. And then your business owners and your public, you know, reach out to them, make sure they understand the purpose of the roundabout, the benefits, how it operates and, and how it may benefit them in, in making their business um, more desirable for people to go to because of ease of access or maybe better aesthetics in their community. Maybe it increases their property value long term because of cleaning up the area and better aesthetics and and better better access, less traffic congestion and, and safety, and, and then last your public. But you know, this stakeholder group is pretty important and it, it's it's much bigger than you would typically have with any intersection improvement. So, you know, keep that in mind. A little more outreach early on. So the basics, roundabouts are circular intersections. They they typically have improved safety over other intersection types and they reduced reduce congestion. In the United States, we have about 7,000 roundabouts constructed so far. I put this up here just so everyone could have familiarity with this website. This is a great resource, roundabouts.kittleson.com. And if you're preparing for a public involvement meeting or, or meeting with, um, with, with your town, 
uh, your, your client. This is a great resource to be able to go and look up information statistics to be able to bring the meetings. I just grabbed a few screenshots for it for this presentation just to give you guys exposure to it. But, you know, having people understand there's 7,000 roundabouts in the United States is, is pretty helpful. And you're trying to sell one in one community that doesn't have any. And then diving in a little deeper, you know, over time in the last 20 years, roundabout construction in the United States has really picked up. That's that's when it's happened. Um, now, going back to about 2004 or so, that's when that article in the newspaper came out when I, I showed that one at the Oyster River in West Haven with the, the failures near the ocean and the cartoon. But look at how many have been done since then. We've been averaging in the country about 400 roundabouts a year annually for 15 years. And that, that data is on the Kittleson website. Some states that are notable that have significant amount of roundabouts, California, 622, Florida, 587, you know, and closer to us, New York, they've got 188 roundabouts in their state. And, and the programs are just going to continue because everyone realizes they're a success. In New England, we've got 337, Connecticut, Kittleson's reporting 35, now their data is a little bit greater than what Connecticut DOT would put out because because Kittleson is looking at um, neighborhood circles. They're probably even looking at maybe shopping center, parking lot type roundabouts. They're they're grabbing probably a bigger perspective than DOT would and what we would put a definition of roundabouts. But um, you know, definition of a roundabout: a circular intersection with a junction which road traffic is permitted to flow in one direction around a center island. And priority is typically given to traffic already in the junction. And, and this is kind of a, a big understanding to have over what was formerly known as a rotary, you know, where the old days of the rotary or traffic circle, um, vehicles in the circle had the right of way, um, or they had the they had the yield, the vehicles on the approach had the, had the right of way. And, and that's been flipped around with a modern roundabout. You know, now the vehicles in the circle have the right of way. And as you're approaching the roundabout, um, you have to yield the vehicles already in the circular roadway. Some features of roundabouts, all very important. We have crosswalks for pedestrians, and we'll talk a lot about more about that later. Um, very important to consider pedestrian accommodations with your roundabout design. Yield signs, if you have a community area where it's maybe a rural environment or maybe an area that doesn't already have any roundabouts, you might want to double up on the yield signs. That's something you could do in MUTCD, one on the splitter and then one on the right approach. Your truck apron, this provides the deflection. So vehicles are coming in, you know, they kind of get deflected around that curb line and that's what reduces your speed. The raised splitter islands, those are also very important to the, the function of the roundabout because that kind of lines vehicles up on the approach so that they feel that deflection when they're coming in. And, and then your center landscaped island, which a goal here would be to have some type of plantings that can provide target value on the approach to the roundabout so that you, you actually see there's, a, there's something in the roadway up here, makes you slow down. And then also screening so that as you're at the approach, you're not you're not really looking for someone on the other side and trying to beat them into the circular roadway. So, you know, you want to be able to look into the circular roadway and then maybe to the approach on the left side, but not all the way across the roundabout. So some screening in the center island with landscaping is, is always a good idea. Not a roundabout, you know, in some communities, especially with with older citizens, they're going to remember these things that we had previously that were, were very frustrating to drive these old traffic circles. You know, they had very high speed entries, multiple lanes, you had weaving, very high speeds. You know, these things were designed to actually store your queuing in the circle, not on the approach, but you were storing vehicles and stacking them in the circle and and um, they were very difficult for a lot of people to navigate and and there's still some residual hate for that which is giving us some difficulty in advancing roundabout programs but modern roundabout to move the same traffic would probably look something like this where the circular roadway is a much smaller diameter and then you're actually storing your traffic on the approach that's kind of one of the big differences so you're storing your traffic on the approach and then um, your circular roadway is just for operation and changing direction. 
and and the rules of the road are a little different too. On the approach to the roundabout, you're yielding where people in the circular roadway have the right of way, and that was the opposite on an old traffic circle or rotary years ago. So modern roundabouts are typically smaller circles, reduce speed congestion, their yield on entry, no weaving or lane changing is intended within the roundabout. You set up on your proper lane assignment as you're coming in and you carry that through. This is your design manual. Everyone should be familiar with this, whether you're part of the landscape design team, planning, uh, engineering, traffic, highway design, um, this this is your guide. Everyone should be somewhat familiar with this manual. There's a lot of good stuff in here. Even illumination is covered in this, and um, that's an important part of the design too. We'll talk about later. So NCHRP 672. I heard there's a new version 673 coming out soon with some additional information. So looking at some features of modern roundabouts, this is one just recently constructed by Connecticut DOT. You have a splitter island. This and and some street trees, you have a chicane coming in and this is all intended for speed reduction. That's that's what these func per, that's what these features provide speed reduction. The chicane is not a requirement per the manual and it's just one design technique that can be used. Tangent sections are are OK and in some urban areas that's all you're going to have room for is a tangent section on the approach. But what you want to be cognizant for of is is traffic calming, speed reduction. That's that's the intent of this whole approach, is just to have an opportunity to communicate to the driver that they need to reduce speeds, so that they can be set up appropriately for for the yield, um, to be safe here once they get to that point. Very important. As you get closer to the actual circular roadway, you know, we still have our splitter islands kind of channelizing traffic and forcing you into the, the direction you need to be. You've got that truck apron that's kind of giving you a deflection and, and we've got the crosswalk, all important features. Your dual yield signs are, are a pretty good safety benefit if you're in an area that doesn't already have roundabouts or especially in more of a rural area. Um, just visibility there with with helping to communicate to drivers what they need to do. And with a roundabout again, drivers yield on entry. So the vehicle in the circular roadway, he's got the right of way. Your truck apron, this has a curb associated with it. We'll talk about a little bit more later in the presentation. This is how you get your larger vehicles through the roundabout. They're intended to ride up on that curb and utilize this surface to navigate around. And the truck apron is what creates the horizontal curvilinear geometry that helps to slow traffic on the approach. Now this curb height can vary in the manual. I think they'll let you go up to three inches. The former manual was four. At Connecticut DOT, we've been using two inches and it's worked pretty well. I mean, the intent of the curb is, is really just to keep vehicles off of the truck apron. So you want the curb high enough to deter vehicles from driving on it, but not too high that a vehicle can't ride up on it if they need to, like a, a WB62 or something towing a long trailer. So in Connecticut, we've tried to map as best we can through local knowledge um, roundabouts that, that are either in the planning process or constructed. We've got 13 in design or planning at DOT right now, and we've got about 14 that we've accounted for that have been constructed. I think since I made this map last spring, there's probably been three more completed. The one up in Stafford is now complete, and there's one in Norwich that just opened up recently at Franklin Square. And I think there's one down in the Guilford area that might have opened up recently too. So, you know, constantly more roundabouts coming out and it's it's really our intersection of preferred choice if it's appropriate for that location based on safety and capacity that you can get out of it. So roundabouts versus a traffic signal. Roundabouts have lower speeds. They're typically 15 to 25 miles an hour. 25 mile an hour design is, is kind of max per the manual. And they work very well because they eliminate left turns. There's no left turns with a roundabout. You you enter the roundabout making a right, basically circulate around the circular roadway and then exit to the right. You've eliminated the crossing maneuvers from the intersection and that's which um, enhances safety. You, know, you have fewer decisions to make and you don't have those crossing maneuvers. 
the crossing maneuvers are what result in pretty severe crashes if there is a, a mistake. And then, you know, I put a note here, drivers don't run roundabouts. And and you got to think about that a little bit. You've, you've got this curvilinear geometry coming in. You've got these fixed objects kind of screening in the middle here, this curbing. Um, the, all of these features that kind of help promote traffic calming, you really have to pay attention as you're entering the roundabout. Whereas a traffic signal, you know, you just kind of drive up, you look as the light red, yellow, green, you make a decision, you go. Um, drivers tend to need to be a little bit more attentive at the roundabout. And, you know, another side benefit of that is you have less people distracted at roundabouts because you have to be an active driver to navigate these things. You're always looking, you're paying attention, you're driving through this curvilinear geometry. Whereas at a traffic signal or a stop sign, you know, especially the signals, you know, how many times does someone pull up? We notice somebody in traffic, they're waiting at the red light, they get bored, they pull out their phone, they're texting, they're looking at something on their phone. You're not going to have somebody doing that at a roundabout because it requires them to be attentive. And, and that's another benefit to the, to the safety um, improvements you get with a roundabout. So traffic signal requires warrants, a roundabout does not. Um, signals tend to result in more crashes, especially if they're a new intersection control and people aren't used to them, but you always have drivers that are inattentive and somebody's going to make a mistake and then you have aggressive drivers that take short gaps and, and they create problems. So you end up with rear end crashes, angle crashes, and traffic signals, although a lot of communities say, hey, can you put, put a signal here that'll fix our problem? They don't address high speeds. You know, you always got to remember at some point that that light has got the green ball and it's the through movement and people are coming through at 40 or 50 miles an hour. So you always have that high speed to deal with at a traffic signal with a roundabout. It's it's 25 miles an hour max. You just can't physically get through it over 25 miles an hour. And there's a lot of safety benefits that come from reducing speeds. The other thing with a traffic signal is that they're significantly less efficient in the off peak periods. So we design our signals to work effectively for the peak hour. And that's, you know, that's, that's how the phasing has always been designed in the off peak hour. And unless you have more modern devices on, on the signal for traffic control, you know, you're, you're still going by that phasing and, and and all legs getting appropriate assignment to go and you you typically end up with a lot of delay at, at certain points in in the signal process especially if you get a pedestrian phase that kicks in you know that's a lot of inefficiency and delay where where certain movements could still occur at around about so you're building infrastructure with a traffic signal look at what you got to put in you know all, all this stuff to maintain in the future and look at you know, this can be expensive down the road as a life cycle cost and, and things to take care of. So another reason to look at roundabouts as maybe a first choice. When you look at a roundabout versus stop controlled intersection or traffic signal, we, we talked about eliminating the left turns and you have a reduction in conflict points with a roundabout because of that. This, this image to the left, it has all the crossing maneuvers that would be made at a conventional intersection, whether it was a traffic signal or side street stop controlled. These are all the crossing maneuvers that vehicles might make at that intersection. That's where you get your side swipes, your T-bones, your, your more severe crashes occurring, especially at the high speed. When you look at the roundabout, you've only got eight conflict points. It's basically the person pulls up at the yield, they look to the left. If, if it's clear, they go, they enter, there's one conflict point. And then as they're circulating within the roadway, they, they put on their signal and they exit right. And that's that's the, the other conflict point. It adds up to eight on a, on a four leg roundabout. You can expect a 75% reduction in conflict points by going to a roundabout. And you can expect a 40 for 50% reduction in speed. I'm gonna say typically not, I mean, that that's just kind of a generalization I made based on most signalized roadways, but reducing your speed by 40 to 50% is, is a big safety benefit in most communities. So roundabouts being safe for all users, and we at DOT have gotten a lot of support from the bicycle community uh, in implementing roundabouts. So make sure you reach out to them if you have any locations you're implementing a roundabout that might have an active bike group. They can be a, a, a very strong partner in helping get the project moving ahead. 
but cyclists can take the lane. This is the light blue line coming through here. Your speeds are 15 to 25 miles an hour typically. Most avid cyclists can keep up with cars doing 15 to 25 miles an hour. So as they're coming down the shoulder of the road, they would just move into the center of the lane, pull up to the yield like a vehicle, it look to the left. If it's safe, there's a gap, they go and they just travel through with the cars and then they move back into the shoulder when they clear the intersection. That would pertain to this woman here in the yellow. You know, you could, she could tell she's an avid cyclist. She can keep up with traffic at 15, 25 miles an hour, no problem. Someone that maybe was more of a novice or children, you know, they could exit the roadway at the crosswalk or a bike ramp that you provided, walk their bike on the sidewalk, walk their bike through the crosswalk, get across the roundabout, and then re-enter the roadway again. So there, there's options, and, and the same goes for pedestrians. Now, the benefit to pedestrians at a roundabout is you only have to cross one lane at a time. Pedestrians crossing a roundabout, they enter the crosswalk, they go out to this yeah. refuge island, and they continue their they're crossing to the other side if there's a gap and it's safe to go. And we'll talk about that a little bit further in the presentation. Now, the benefits of speed reduction, and then I got this slide from Amy Watkins at Watch From ACT, um, it was very helpful in kind of demonstrating the benefits of reducing speeds at an intersection. So 20 miles an hour, if a pedestrian is hit, nine out of 10 survive. At 30 miles an hour, if a pedestrian is hit, five out of 10 survive. Once you get over 30 miles an hour, um, the survivability of a pedestrian strike is is pretty limited. Um, it you know chances are are pretty grim if that person's going to make it or not. So you know this is where your roundabout design is. You're down in this 20 20 to 30 mile an hour range, typically under under 25. So you're you're in here, which means if there is a mistake um, and a pedestrian is hit, you know you've you've just increase that person's chances of survivability by 90 percent over what you might have had with a typical signalized intersection um, that that maybe there was an issue at the crosswalk climate control uh, sustainable transportation uh, or cl climate change rather sustainable transportation green infrastructure you know roundabouts fit all of that for, for purposes of, of those concerns in the community. Um, roundabouts tend to be much more efficient than traffic signals because they don't have the delay built into them. Basically, you pull up to the yield, you pull up to the yield here. If it's clear to the left, you go. You can have multiple legs going all at the same time, and you don't always have that with a signalized intersection. Because of that, you get a, an increased capacity, typically better operation and reduced fuel. And the other part of that is because you also don't have traffic stopped at the signal, just idling for a long time, uh, waiting for the light to turn green. You know, you, you typically movements occur much quicker here and, you know, you don't have the idling queue. And, and also you have kind of a rolling entry because it's a yield as long as it's clear to the left. And, and that affects the use of of um, fuel through the intersection. Whereas if you're coming up to a red light and you've actually got to stop, you know, a lot of people see the light turn green and then they hit the gas. Um, that creates a lot of emissions, pollution, and and it it it's hard on fuel consumption as well. So there's there's environmental benefits to using roundabouts in a lot of ways too. This is a much older study. It was in Time magazine. I've I've used it a number of times at public information meetings. It's very helpful. There's there's also some newer ones on the web if if you Google it. S aesthetic benefits of roundabouts, um, showing to your community the pictures over on the left. Um, you know th this is a, a nice. Center Island, you've got a flagpole with some uplighting, some landscaping. Then on the top right, this is what that intersection looked like before. You have all this pavement, kind of traffic congestion, you know, certainly nothing aesthetic or desirable about this location. But by implementing the roundabout, now you kind of have a sense of place. You've, you've probably reduced your pavement footprint a little bit and um, Certainly something that's this may be a little more environmentally sensitive and, and pleasing as far as a place where people want to be. And same thing in the bottom, you know, the picture on the bottom left, this see all this wide pavement that was here before. Um, this this was um, 
West Haven, Connecticut, one of the first roundabouts Connecticut DOT did on a, on a state route. This was side street stop controlled previously. And uh, the city was interested in putting in a traffic signal. And we talked them into over a very long period of time and a lot of effort, talked them into building a modern roundabout. And, and here's a picture of the roundabout in that intersection over to the right. And, you know, this is just better for the community. Aesthetically, it's better. Um, environmentally, it's better. And and showing these types of pictures at, at public involvement can, can really be helpful. And when I say showing these types of things, um, you really want to have some visualization in your public involvement package. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But that's that's how you do that. Now, Will a roundabout work at my intersection? We talked about the manual and CHRP 672. So there's some kind of rule of thumb type guides in the manual based on studies that were done. You know, generally, if you're you're under 16,000 uh, ADT, definitely, you know, under the 25,000 single lane is is probably going to work, but you got to do some analysis if you're down around the 15,000 ADT. For planning purposes, you can have confidence a single lane roundabout is probably going to work, but up to 25,000, you, you might get that too. You just got to check it. But this is kind of a quick guide for planning as far as whether a single lane roundabout will work at your location or if you have to look at auxiliary lanes included or, or a full multi lane roundabout. Then there's also a rule of thumb as far as um, will it work based on, on capacity for for uh, ADT for vehicles entering and vehicles circulating. So the rule of thumb is is a thousand in conflicting maneuver movements. So what you have is this VC here. This is your conflicting vehicles versus vehicles entering. And what the manual is telling you to do is go to the other legs all the way around the circle, add up all the traffic that would eventually end up at this point. That's your conflicting movement. And then here's your vehicles entering. So look at that, add those two numbers together. If it's under a thousand, you can have confidence you're gonna work, it's gonna work. You know, roundabout capacity is is all based on gap acceptance. And this theory is kind of um, working towards the number of vehicles entering versus number of vehicles conflicting. And will these vehicles entering be able to find gaps? And that's how that that 1,000 vehicles per hour kind of came up as a rule of thumb. Studies since this was done have shown that even up to 1,400 vehicles conflicting um, seems to have worked in some areas. I know 1,200 now is being really considered acceptable, but we've heard up to 1,400 is, has worked pretty well too. And it's all based on gap acceptance theory, which is based on driver behavior. You know, how quickly do vehicles enter the roundabout? How much of a gap do they need to feel comfortable? And that's different. It's different based on region, different areas of the country, different areas of the world. Um, that gap theory kind of changes a little bit based on driver behavior. So that's that's changed over time. But if you use a thousand, you you have confidence that's going to work. So for traffic analysis, there's a lot of tools available to you um, to start with. The one that's cheap and free, Georgia DOT has an Excel spreadsheet online. You can just get off their website. It, it uses HM6 equations. That's free. You, you could just plug your data right into that spreadsheet and it'll give you some pretty reliable information as to whether a roundabout's going to work or not at your site. Uh, Vistro, Synchro 11 seems to be the one that DOT is, is moving towards. It uses HM6 equations and I think this is going to be our preferred roundabout analysis tool at DOT moving ahead. And then we have VISM, which is really good for modeling to kind of show you how the roundabout is going to operate, different queues coming in, how long does it back up, um, how long does it take for it to clear out. And, you know, advice I want to leave you guys with as far as traffic analysis, it seems to be beneficial to use more than one software if you have a complex site. Um, the, these tools sometimes all work a little bit differently, look at different things, especially VISM and Synchro. They they definitely look at things a little differently. Um, but if you ever have a complex site where it's kind of on the edge of working or not, try to model it in two different softwares, in two different approaches, just, just to have confidence that you're going to be okay. Uh, VISM seems to work very well for traffic modeling, display at public information meetings. It also gives you a lot of information about how long the queuing is going to last, how long it's going to clear out. 
And, and that's very helpful in making decisions to move ahead at, at complex sites. It's been a great tool for DOT. So thinking outside the circle, roundabouts don't have to be round. You know, the idea is that it's a circular intersection and you're just eliminating left turns. So an oval will work, an egg shape will work. Um, it, you have urban areas that you're kind of locked in with, with intersection configurations you've got to kind of work with. Don't be afraid to try shapes other than a circle to try to get something to function in in the theory and method of, of roundabout design. They're perfectly acceptable and they can work very well. Roundabout features, um, you know, we, we have our entry, our yield line, our truck apron. This gray shaded area here, this is your, your buffer strip. This is your, your could be planted or it could be a hardscape area. We'll talk more about that a little bit later in the design. Truck apron, splitter islands, we've covered some of that already. We'll flip through um, features. We've seen some of this again. Um, let's talk about the design process. This is probably what's most important to you guys. So you're going to start first with a concept layout. You may be looking at an aerial photo, Google Earth, doing some rough sketching. You're, you're looking at volumes on a, on a planning level to see if something will work. You know, you just want to sketch something in for your client. Then you start looking at geometry, um, entry and exit design, trying to, trying to fit that in with the location of the circle that you sketched up. And you're going to eventually detail the the width of your entry the width of your circular roadway uh, get your deflection where you want it and then after you've got it what you would call designed you have to do a performance check and it's pretty important to understand this process you've, you've got a concept layout then you start applying widths and geometry to it section 6.4 in the manual and then once you got the layout you got to check it to see if it works and these performance checks are fastest path, sec, uh, section 6.7 in the manual. Then you're going to be looking at the design vehicle and make sure the design vehicle can get through there and, and site distance. Those are kind of your performance checks. More than likely, because roundabouts tend to be an iterative process, it doesn't come out perfect the first time. It might, but more than likely, something in your performance check is going to fail. And then you're going to go back up to the top. It might have been a right away concern you had in addition to the technical performance check, but you're going to go back up to the top. You might move the center of the circle around to another location. Then you revise your approach geometry, maybe change lane widths or something to get the truck through for your performance check on your WB62. You're going to come back down to the bottom. You're going to do your performance checks again. Maybe something still doesn't pass. You're going to go back up to the top. You're going to move the center of the circle around a little bit more, tweak your approach geometry, tweak a lane width or something, check your fastest path again, check your design vehicle, make sure the truck can get through. And eventually you're you're going to dial it in and, it, and it's you're going to get it to where it works. But it's very important that we understand that the roundabout design is an iterative process. It, it's not one and done. It's it's a lot more time consuming and complex than just laying out a turning lane at a signalized intersection to get a little more capacity. And here's kind of an example of that. You know, this is a single lane roundabout design and in the top left, they've got the center of the circle here. I mean, this is a good design that would, you know, that would work. Then, then someone moved it to the south because of some right away concerns they had. This design still works, but you know, they had things they were trying to avoid and look at different impacts. And then they've got another design here where it's kind of shifted to the east a little bit more and they get right away impacts over here. So it kind of shows you that the, the, the there's there's no not necessarily one solution for the roundabout or one right way to design the roundabout, but a lot of options to look at to get it right. And especially when you consider technical performance checks and you're going to have redesign work. And why that's important to everyone. You need more time and money in the preliminary design of your project compared to a conventional intersection. So if, if you guys had a, a client, you're designing a roundabout versus a traffic signal, things to consider 
in the signalized intersection, maybe you're adding a turning lane or upgrading an intersection with a signal. The bulk of the design work is probably more in final design. That's when you're going to lay out the mast arm locations. That's when you're going to do your signal timing. That's when you're going to do your your, your markings, all your final design work. It, it, it tends to come at the end. And the early stages are just the highway component, just identifying the new edge of road and your grading limits, and you move ahead. You're ready for PD and public info. Maybe do a capacity analysis to make sure you got the lane arrangements right. Well, with a roundabout, you've got to go through that iterative process that we talked about earlier to find out where's the center of the circle got to be. You know, can I get the design vehicle to work through here? Does it actually fit with the right of way I have available to me? You're going to spend a lot more money up front. Um, now, the, the final design is going to be cheaper because you've actually done the bulk of the work up front. But when you're laying out your man hours for a roundabout project, put in a lot more hours up front for the PD than you typically would for a conventional intersection because that's that's where you're doing a lot of alternatives review, a lot of iteration and and trying to get it right. Because when you go to public info at the roundabout, you wanna have confidence that the center of the circle is gonna stay where you're showing it later on. Um, your, your, your lane arrangements are what you're proposing at, at the public info are gonna be what they are for final design. That stuff is, is pretty critical to have that right at, at the PD and public info. And then the final design is really just a signing and marking plan and maybe a look at constructability. So laying out roundabouts, a couple, a few different practices that can be used. Um, left aligned is preferred. And what does that mean? That, that means the center of the roadway goes over the left side of, of the circular eye of the center island. So that gives you the maximum deflection. And you can kind of see that pretty clearly as you're about to enter the roundabout here. You've got a lot of deflection. This is where you get your speed control. So this is definitely the preferred. Um, a center aligned roundabout is, is works too, but you usually need a bigger diameter circle. You can kind of see that a little bit. And, and you need that to get your, your speed control, your deflection, because as you're coming in, um, you're pushed more to the right, so that means you got to have a bigger truck apron here to kind of give you deflection, meaning you probably need a bigger diameter circle. Yeah. What's very difficult and, and not recommended is right aligned, and that means the approach roadway coming in, uh, the center of that is over the right side of the center island, and this is where you have a very difficult time achieving speed control your fastest path through here is going to be very difficult to get to work because you, you're not getting the deflection that you really need and you would get much more easily out of a left aligned roundabout. Now, the center aligned roundabout is sometimes needed. They can't always be left aligned. If you're working in an urban environment, things are pretty built up. You know, your, your rights away is, is much more limited. You're probably going to be having to work with the footprint of the existing intersection to a much greater extent and fit a circle within the footprint of the existing intersection. And that's where the center aligned is, is probably going to be your choice. Um, whereas the left aligned, they can end up taking up a little more right away in real estate because you're pushing the roadway over to the to the right on this side, and then you're going to push it over to the left on this side to keep both of them left aligned. And, and it eats up a little more right away. So you need more room for those. Very, very important technical design feature when you're designing the roundabout. Um, and CHRP 672, this exhibit 614 is important to remember for any of the highway designers. So this curve going along the edge of the splitter island needs to be tangent to the truck apron to have smooth operation. This this um, concept here, technical requirement, is very important that this radius is tangent to this curve down here. Very important. Here's some examples of, of roundabouts that maybe didn't come out the best. Um, and Sometimes we, we learn as designers that these things, you don't see them on paper as easily as when they're built. We've all been there in our careers, you know, and here's something where, 
you know, th this is right aligned. You have your approach roadway coming in. The center of the approach roadway is, is to the right of the center island. And, you know, I, I threw this on here just to kind of make a point. Um, you're not going to get your speed control that was really intended with this type of roundabout design. And, and the speed control is what gives you the safety component of the project. So, you know, this was implemented. It, it might have improved traffic operations significantly. And it, it might have improved safety somewhat too, but you're not going to get the desired safety with without the speed control. This would have very high speeds going through here because you're not getting any deflection at all. And that's an example of right aligned. Sometimes, and it'd be easier on a piece of paper, you actually got to look down the paper and look at the alignment to see these kind of things because they don't always pop out that easily for with a CAD drawing when you look at it. And here's another one. You know, this is right aligned. You have the center of the approaching roadway and it's going over the right side of, of, the, of the circular center island. Um, you have no speed control on this approach at all. You know, you, you could probably hit this at 40, 50 miles an hour and that's not the intended goal of a roundabout. And it wouldn't surprise me if, if in the early stages of the design, when folks were looking at this, you know, they kind of looked at it like this leg maybe was pulling up and, you know, was getting some deflection maybe with some curvature here because the splitter islands way over here. But when they actually put the final striping on it, the way the striping's laid out and, and the way the approach roadway ended up, um, you didn't get any deflection at all out of it. And I, I think what they really needed to do is kind of hook this approach into it a little greater and run this curb out a little more. And But just something to look at in your designs. Um, look out for right alignments as you're doing your approach. You do not get the speed control out of it. And if someone did a, a performance check on this and looked at fastest path, they, they would have found it was going to fail. So I'm not sure. This is in the United States. I'm, I'm not sure what happened there. There's probably a reason why they did what they did. I've talked about performance checks quite a bit. Let's let's look at what they are. Fastest path. Um, that's this this light blue line coming through the intersection. It's the path the vehicle would take if they tried to use up all of the available pavement. Essentially, if you were to drive this aggressively and hug the inside of the roadway on the splitter, and then try to cut to the outside on the radius and then kind of hug the inside of Splitter Island and then cut back in over here, you know, that would be using all available pavement without hitting the curb for the fastest route through the intersection. You're basically flattening the curvature. How fast could you go? So you want to check this R1, you're checking R2, and you're checking R3, and the manual tells you you should be under 25 miles an hour uh, for these speeds coming through here. The ones that typically will give you trouble is this blue fastest path here, which is the through movement or the right turn. The right turn, sometimes the green, ends up being problematic because we end up widening out this curb line to try to get the, the design vehicle through the WB62. You run the performance check for the 62, we realize, oh, I got to flatten out the radius on this corner, or widen the pavement. Then you got to go back and check your fastest path again. And sometimes, widening for the truck we create ourselves problems with the fastest path that we have to go back and later ad adjust the approach geometry to mitigate that so that's that's kind of where some of the iteration comes in and my point at which you want to put a lot more man hours on your job in the pd phase than you typically would for an intersection because you have to go through these design challenges to, to, to get something that, that meets the design criteria. So 25 miles an hour is our maximum looking at these performance checks for, for speed. And let's look at that in practice on an actual roundabout. So here's the blue line. This is our through movement on the fastest path coming through. Here's our R1, 24 miles an hour. R2 is 17. That's just radius in the middle. And then on the exit here, this is R3, that's 31. And you guys are saying, gee, Scott, what happened, right? I just told you, keep it under 25 miles an hour. Well, the manual tells you under 25 miles an hour. The manual is also a guide, an informational guide. It's not a standard. And roundabout principles, practices, design techniques have been evolving. Things that we used for roundabout design 15 years ago are not the same techniques that we're using today as we're getting more roundabouts across the country. 
practitioners are sharing with each other. We're sharing our successes, our failures. We're all learning from each other and we're refining these techniques and, and we're doing better and we're learning. So one of the things that we've all learned over time is that this R3 is really not too important because you've typically slowed them down quite a bit on your R1 and R2. That's where you're going to get your speed control in the, right here. And then what happens is someone starts accelerating a little bit after the R2. Well, we found a benefit in having a tangential exit. What you don't want to have happen on your roundabout is bring this curvature around significantly to try to reduce this R3 substantially. Because when the traffic flows around the circular roadway and they go to exit, if they have to break to slow down to exit, it interferes with operation in the roundabout. You want the traffic going around your circular roadway pretty smoothly, just hit the blinker, make a right turn and exit very smoothly and efficiently. The idea is between R2 and R3, it's a very short distance. It's really not possible to accelerate from 17 to 31 miles an hour in that short distance for most drivers and most vehicles. And the other benefit we found with tangential exits over operation is safety for pedestrians. So if you're in the circular roadway and you're driving, you're kind of pointing in this direction and then you got to make a hard right to go around some curvature here. You're not looking at the crosswalk when you exit. You're, you, the driver's eye might be more here and he doesn't end up looking at the crosswalk till he's actually turned the steering wheel to get into it. If you have a tangential exit, it creates visibility from the driver's eye to the crosswalk from much further back and it makes it much safer for pedestrians. So tangential exit kids much preferred. This shows you your fastest path. Um, the green line, this shows you your fastest path for the right turn. I only drew these two. Um, the left turn fastest path, that, that's usually never an issue. It's always the right turn that will give you problems or the through movement. Anytime you make an adjustment later to your design, you, you moved a curb line, you, you change geometry just a little bit for something that came up in the design, make sure you go back and do these performance checks again. You should keep a file in your design um, path somewhere where you, you keep this and you go back and update it with every little adjustment that you made just to make sure that some little tweak you made along the way didn't end up violating the speed control later and you didn't realize it. So um, this is kind of a cradle to grave things, these, these performance checks. They're iterative. You have to keep redoing them every time you make an adjustment and then keep that data in your project file. Guaranteed something's going to happen in construction. Somebody will want to make an adjustment or tweak something, move a curb line just a little, and you're going to need to go back to this data and look at it again. So it's it's good to screenshot it. Every time you do it, screenshot it and keep it in the file. So, you know, conventional roadway, traffic signal, you've got a pretty flat geometry, typically higher speeds through an intersection, and that's where we have those safety concerns we talked about with the pedestrians. You enter a roundabout into that location and you've got this curvilinear geometry, you're reducing speeds. That's the deflection we were talking about, uh, predominantly with the left aligned intersections or the center aligned roundabouts, but but not, not right aligned. So you wanna be in the 15 to 25 miles an hour coming through here and, and that's how your deflection is achieved and your speed control. Visual strength, I feel is very important on roundabouts. And when I mean, when, you, when I say visual strength, that's that's features within the roundabout design, whether it's municipal signing, flagpoles, landscaping, thing, things that the driver can see within the roadway that basically tell him and communicate to the driver that there's a roundabout here. And it, it's not just flat, wide open pavement. Anything that communicates to the driver, we need to slow down, can be helpful for safety. You know, just make sure you're not putting fixed objects in there that that would significantly violate roadside design manual. You know, these municipal signings on four by four posts, or I've used six by six posts and just notched them to a four by four, you know, flag poles, they're, they're pretty small. They're, they're not likely to get hit as, as being a big object. Um, and here's another example of how you get your speed control. Now this one, what's important to note on the right side here, this is stamped asphalt. 
Um, drivers can actually go over that and straighten the curve a little bit, but I found it works pretty well. Another design technique here would have been to put an outside truck apron in, meaning put probably a small granite curb here with maybe a two inch height and then build concrete truck apron here on the outside. And, and that's a sure way to make sure you're gonna get your speed control through here. And every site is a little different. You have to make decisions that are appropriate for that location and that site. In, in what DOT has had experienced, we've done a lot of this stamped asphalt, Street Print XD, it's worked very well. It probably deters drivers about 80% of the time to, to staying in this type of path and not driving over it. You know, the aggressive drivers will, but 80% of the time it works pretty well. And this is much more forgiving on maintenance vehicles. You come through with a plow, there's no curbing here to hit. You put an outside truck apron here and you get a couple inches of snow, that plow driver cannot see it. It becomes very difficult. And um, just consider that in your designs. Do I really want an outside truck apron or not? Maybe I can do some stamp, pavement stamping or hatching or something. We look for gradual deceleration on our designs. You, you want people slowing as they're approaching the roundabout. We wanna put features in the design that communicate with people that they need to start slowing. What you don't want is all the slowing right at the yield. So rural roundabouts, higher speed roundabouts, we like splitter islands 200 feet long to help with deceleration. You got the keep right sign there that helps. We have landscaping, um, kind of the visual strength. I like that. This one's got a monument in the middle. We, we would not do that again at DOT. Um, we've learned since we've done that, things that happen, happen safety concerns that happen in other states. Um, but this type of center island treatments, I think these are all fine, generally conform to roadside design manual. And this visual strength in all of these, these, these center island features, which your landscape design folks can help you with, um, they, they all help with safety. It's not window dressing. They, they help with traffic calming. They help with visibility. My favorite thing to put in center islands, which I strongly believe enhances nighttime safety is uplighting. If you can put a municipal sign or flag poles, even if it's landscaping trees, and then you provide uplighting on it, that's a feature that stands out at nighttime. What, what we don't think about sometimes, especially if you have a location that's signalized today and you're going to be removing the signal and putting in the roundabout, at nighttime, that intersection can be kind of a little dark where the signal used to be. So if you have the uplighting, that's something that, people can see from quite a distance back and it tells them that, hey, there's there's a roundabout ahead. There's something important going on here. It's it's not just a conventional intersection. I got to slow down. So, you know, here's an example of the uplighting and how powerful that can be at nighttime to, um, to improve safety and enhance safety of your intersection. It, it's cheap, very inexpensive, and, and I think uh, a big component of safety with our designs. That's not something you'll find in the manual. That's that's just my my personal experience and belief. So back to the performance checks, we're looking at our design vehicle. We have buses, we have trucks, the WB62 and 67. We'll talk about those. And then we have vertical challenges. You know, these these are horizontal challenges with performance checks. The bus, the turning, moving the bus, we're all familiar with that. The WB62 using our auto track, auto turn, turning templates horizontal challenges, um, you know, something we all think about, something we don't always think about are vertical challenges. We've got that truck apron with a vertical curb, and we have these types of vehicles that have to navigate through the intersection. So you've, you've got to look at your design in 3D and look at that curb and see if, if putting uh, a tangent across the curb where the truck is going to be can that truck clear the curb? And I've had a couple of locations where we've done that and we ended up with problems. I mean, problems we caught in the design process and we, we modified the design to accommodate the truck. Um, but but it, I was glad that we checked. Otherwise, this type of vehicle would have been dragging on the curbing in the center island getting through the truck apron. So what we did to fix it, we, we might have tweaked the cross slope a little bit on one corner of the roundabout. Maybe we didn't do a 2% all the way to the outside curb. Maybe we only did a 1%. Um, that picked it up a little bit. I've had situations where we drop the curb on the center island an inch. So instead of having a two inch 
um, lip all the way around. Maybe one corner we did an inch and then transitioned it back up to two inches where the affected area was. So those are things that you can do. Um, change your profile grade a little bit to pick up the area where the wheels are on the truck um, to give more clearance. And then your fire trucks. The fire trucks are typically never a problem at the roundabout. If the rest of these vehicles all work, um, these are almost always going to work. But it is important, I'm going to say, for community involvement and, and community support and, and just to deal with the naysayers that might come up at your community meeting, that you have outreach to the local fire department, understand what type of fire truck they have, and look at your turning templates you have available on auto turn and run something similar through. Just so when you get to the public meeting and someone says, hey, that's going to be restrictive for fire trucks, you can tell them, no, it's not. We've checked it. Um, it it's, it'll, it'll help you out. Just And it'll give the fire department confidence that you you're care about them and you've, you've ensured that they're going to be okay. So the truck apron, this is how that works. The rear wheels go up on the truck apron and, and you know, for past your car, it does not. And what's important here is that the cab of the truck does not go on the truck apron. Very, very important. Anything carrying passengers stays on the circular roadway. Only things in tow go up on the truck apron. Nothing with passengers. So as you're looking at this, um, NCHRP 672, Exhibit 621, stuff's all in the manual. Again, notice what I, I mentioned, the cab of the truck stays on the circular roadway. This is kind of an important concept that we've we've made mistakes on a few times. I, I've seen in plan reviews, um, when you're pulling that template through auto turn, it, it it's so tempting to run the cab of the truck over the apron because it helps you out with the swing back here. But what happens in theory, once that roundabout is built, the operator of the truck doesn't realize where the cab is supposed to go, right? So he's taught from his, his training that the cab's supposed to go on the circular roadway. And that's how he's supposed to navigate the intersection. And if you start designing them, well, one leg, he's got to go up on the, on the truck apron with the cab to make it because I didn't provide enough room over here. And then the other legs, um, you know, the cab of the truck can stay on the circular roadway and make it just fine. We're, we're sending confusing messages to the trucking industry. And they're gonna, you're gonna have problems and it, your roundabout is not gonna be a success. So be consistent. This is something that's in the manual. The cab of the truck stays on the circular roadway. And it's something that we look for in the performance checks. It's, it's a small detail, but it's very important later on when the project is constructed for operation. Buses, anything with passengers does not go on the truck apron. Transit bus, school buses, they stay in the circular roadway and you'll check that with your, with your turning templates. Let's talk about trucks a little bit. So our design vehicle in Connecticut's a WB62. That's the largest vehicle that can travel a state route without a permit. The, the challenge is the trucking industry doesn't like to make a multitude of trucks. And they kind of like to have one thing that can be used with a lot of diversity. What you're typically going to see on our roadways is a WB67. And it says 53 foot trailer on the side of it. And you'll notice a lot of trucks, they say 53. That is by manufacturer, a WB67 truck. And what happens to conform to Connecticut guidelines, because Connecticut doesn't regulate the length of the box. We don't care if it's a 53 foot box, a 60 foot box. The regulation is by the distance between the center of the rear wheels and the kingpin. This distance is what we regulate, not the box on the trailer. And that's how you establish the difference between a 62 and a 67. It's this distance from, from the rear wheels up to the kingpin. So this is this 40 feet here. Um, here you've got 45. And so this is a little dis distance difference to the center of the rear wheels. It's like five feet more. This is what Connecticut regulates right here. So, so this setup as shown in this diagram will not meet Connecticut standards, but let's take a look at what they do in practice. This was interesting to me when I learned it, so I'm happy to pass it on to you guys. So see how far the rear wheels are pushed ahead on this truck? These trucks are made with carriages underneath that are movable to make them be um, more versatile for different use. So for, for arterial roadways in Connecticut, 
with lighter loads, you're going to slide those rear wheels ahead. And by sliding the rear wheels ahead, you've you've conformed now to WB62 because you've changed the wheelbase. Even though this says it's a 53 foot trailer, they move the wheels ahead and that shortens the, the, the turning radius. Another one here, this is a WB62. The rear wheels are, are, are slid forward, 53. And that way this truck can be used for interstate hauling, very heavy loads, state arterial load uh, hauling, lighter loads. They just slide the rear axle ahead, but this is a 67. And we're, we're designing for the wheelbase. That's what we're designing for. Um, now, when you're using your auto turn, auto track, there's there's a lot of different features available for you in, in that, how to work it and, and speed. Connecticut DOT, we're recommending a five mile an hour speed through here. Although the manual tells you you can go up to 25 miles an hour for your design through the roundabout, we're not applying that to tractor trailers. They should be slowing down, whether it's a truck or a bus, they should be slowing down substantially because of the aggressive geometry they have to navigate. Trucks we're recommending use your auto turn auto track designed for a five mile an hour entry and and design based on that. Keep your cab of your truck on the circular roadway does not go up on on the apron. Only the rear wheels of the truck go up on the apron when you're pulling your turning template through. Be very careful about that. This is this is where the fatal flaw comes in. You know, it, it's so tempting to pull the template across here and say, oh, yeah, that worked but we didn't really provide enough room on this outside curb. And when this gets built later like this, the rear wheels of the truck, they're gonna jump the curb. They're gonna rut the rut the topsoil. We're, we're gonna have kind of an eyesore on the design, which you don't want. So with your performance checks, make sure you're checking thoroughly the entire intersection. You, you've got right turns to check. You've got through movements to check. Um, Make sure you always check the U-turn. It's not something that we would intuitively think people are gonna be doing, but guaranteed eventually someone's gonna to get to that site, they're gonna make a U-turn. So if they make the left, more than likely they can make the U-turn, but it's worth checking it. Same thing with the buses, check all your movements, screenshot these things, save them in a file somewhere. You're gonna need them later to go back and revisit them. You don't want to have to reproduce them all the time. We run the bus at 10 miles an hour with the with the template. And this is what can happen if, if you don't do your performance checks appropriately. And, and you don't want to be the designer that's responsible for this for a client later where you have this kind of off tracking signs are getting ripped out landscaping destroyed. You know, th this is the negativity that that just grows in the community because of failure at a roundabout because maybe we didn't do something right. In, in this case, it wasn't necessarily our fault. What happened here back in 2004 or so when I was designing this, and I am responsible for this, um, our largest vehicle without a permit was a WB50. And, and shortly after that, it changed to a 62. So this intersection was designed for a WB50. And then when 62s got here, this is what happened. So we've, we've since retrofitted it and fixed that. But even with the retrofit, we had some problems. This is new, this is rebuilt. We just fixed this last year. The signs were located too close to the edge of the curb and the truck mirrors were hitting the sign and knocking the sign over. So be careful where you locate your signs. You know, you don't want them too close to the edge of the curve. If, if you had a typical intersection and you're on a tangent, this is no problem. You're not, you're not gonna have anything hanging over the vehicle to catch that. But when you're going into these circular movements, um, that's where you, you have things that may overhang the vehicle a little bit, catch on signs very easily. Your 3D performance check with the low boy truck, very, very important. You want to check the snagging as that truck may be kind of going across the apron right there. There's no standard on these trucks. You guys would ask me, well, Scott, what clearance should I design for? I, I spent a lot of time researching industry on these trucks. There's, there's no set standard by uh, any transportation industry. And what I found best that would seem to give us comfort that's gonna work, look for four to five inches of clearance when they're fully loaded. And I've come up with that by going out to measure a lot of different contractors' trucks and call a lot of manufacturers to come up with that, that number. And I think if you can get in that range, you can have confidence you're not gonna have any snagging. And if you do have snagging, which you might wanna look at in your design, 
just drop the curb down to one inch instead of two. Don't use one inch for the entire truck apron. Just drop it in the one particular area that's a problem. You can also change the cross slopes. So instead of going 2% all the way outside, maybe just do 1% in that one area. You know, don't make it consistent all throughout, but make a minor modification to, to get a little more grade for that truck so you can get through. And here he is in practice. You know, we actually built a roundabout and, and the guy's there. Um, you know, happened to be on site when this happened. He wasn't loaded, so he's got a little bit more clearance here. But, um, you know, thank God we, we checked that for vertical. 4% max grade per the manual through the roundabout. This is another one that's very, very important that, you know, I, I learned through experience why it's important, too, because they, they tell you in the manual it's important for load shift concerns as you're traveling around the roundabout. Um, vehicles that may be carrying liquids especially because it's a circular intersection at some point you're going to go transverse to this grade you're going to go with it for a while and then you got to cross the grade well when you're crossing the grade that's when you can get the load shift occurring and if you violate this four percent you could be in a situation where we flip trucks that that has happened elsewhere in the country and the four percent grade is really important this particular site, I believe it started with like a 6% grade through here, and we cut out a little shelf in the roadway to flatten the grade around the roundabout, and I got it down to four with, with, with a lot of profile reconstruction to make that work. And, you know, here's just a look in, in practice in, you know, my own field experience with why that's so important. When I first went out to this roundabout, do some investigation after it was built, I, and I look at all these, I'm kind of a, a nut, right? We build roundabouts and I go out and watch traffic there for hours. But I noticed a lot of stones up on the splitter island. And I initially thought they were washing out of the center island landscaping area. Maybe I thought it was construction debris. But year after year, six months later, I kept noticing these stones here. And I said, what the heck is going on? And I finally figured it out. It's from load shift dump trucks are coming around this corner they're fully loaded with gravel and their load is spilling out of the truck onto that splitter island and if you look at this truck below i actually took this picture at the salem roundabout you can see how much that truck is leaning with you know potential load shift because of the radius and the speed at which he's coming through and he's hauling a little bit too fast that's why that's happening but that kind of shows you the importance of not violating that 4%. Another suggestion from Scott Bushy, it won't be in the manual, um, avoid the appearance of kinks you know, in, in your design. And on the approach to the roundabout, what I mean by that, take your splitter island, run it through curvature and end it in a tangent area if possible. And there's a couple of reasons for that. If you carry the, the island through the curve, you're going to end up with the keep right sign in a tangent section. And at nighttime, your headlights will hit the sign. If we would have ended the splitter island down here, when you're approaching the roundabout, it, it would give you the appearance there's a kink in the road. But more importantly, the sign goes in perpendicular to the island. It's not, they wouldn't skew it in the field to line up with traffic. They would probably install it perpendicular and your headlights are pointing in this direction and the signs kind of be angled this direction and you're not going to get the benefit of the sign at night with your headlights hitting it if, if it's on an angle. So it's a small uh, tweak to your design, maybe a little bit more money in concrete and curbing. It helps with traffic calming. It helps vehicles enter and feel comfortable. It helps the alignment to be very smooth. Avoid the appearance of a kink. Just be cognizant of ending islands on radiuses. It's it's something that we all do, but you'll you'll notice it on your design. And if you see it, just just extend the island a little bit further and did a tangent. You'll you'll be happy you did later. Curbing at roundabouts. Um, avoid vertical curbs in areas where you have a lot of curvilinear geometry. Whether it's a roundabout or some other project. If, if you've got an area that requires a lot of curvature to navigate the intersection of roadway, avoid these types of vertical curbs. Always use these tapered transitions. And, and the reason is to minimize snagging by the plow truck. So you've got a plow driver coming through here at one o'clock in the morning. There's a few inches of snow. He's been at it a while. That plow, as he's rubbing the curb, 
is going to find its way in into this opening for the pedestrian corridor and it's going to hit this vertical curb you're going to have a bump here and some snagging and the, the severity of it's just going to depend on how fast the driver is plowing and how hard he's hugging that curb and then maybe how much snow is here and if this is covered up when he's coming through but um, that can be very damaging to the equipment and and possibly a, a real safety problem for the driver if he hits it hard he could get hurt and i i did hear of in another state a, a driver did hit something like this and they were pretty badly injured during a snowstorm if you always use these um, tapered curbing transitions the plow can ride up on it and bounce right off you'll never have that problem it, it's just a good design practice that that i've i've learned along the years so we talked a little bit about, about outside truck aprons earlier. Here's another example of this. This one's in Vermont, Manchester, Vermont. And here's a situation where the designer was worried about speeds on the right turn. And, you know, they put the outside truck apron in to, to try to keep, um, hold the edge of road and, and maintain fastest path through here. And that's, that's why they did that. But do you really need it? Um, you know, at the end of the day, did this extra two or three feet really do that much for you? And you could see it's it's all beat up from the plow hitting it. Cars are driving over it. I would recommend um, just use stamped asphalt here or, or maybe just go with a wide shoulder depending on the width. If you're getting over five feet or something, then consider just hatching it out with paint or using stamped asphalt. And most drivers tend to stay off of that. Now, here's another example. This is the same location, but we've we've got these outside truck aprons for speed control. This is elevated. You got a granite curb here, stamped concrete. And for a plow driver, this is kind of difficult and, and could potentially damage the equipment. So there are going to be times where you need this. We have them in Connecticut in Killingworth at Route 80 and 81, and they were necessary. We needed them just because the angles and the approach of the intersection. Um, these these outside areas got very wide and, and you really needed something. So there are times when these are appropriate and needed, but when you get to these smaller intersections, look at them in context. The one thing about this approach, if they decided they needed it, this is a driveway from a stop and shop. It has no speed on it to start with. So we're looking, we're getting speed control here on a driveway that probably didn't even need it. As, as I'm looking at it. And, and this roadway, this is, um, I believe it's Route 7 through Manchester, Vermont. This particular section is, is pretty urban, it's pretty developed, the speeds are pretty low anyway. Um, there's another roundabout downstream just a little bit here anyway, which does help control speeds. But my point, just consider this, do you really wanna do this? Other options are stamped asphalt or maybe just striping this out. Connecticut DOT's had pretty good success with that. And another point to bring up, pay attention to the pedestrian crossing. Um, something went wrong in this one. They've got the truncated domes here with, within the truck apron. This is the roadway, the, the, the sidewalks back here. This is where the rear wheels of the truck are gonna ride up on to go through the intersection. So you don't really want a blind pedestrian coming through here and feeling that he's gonna enter the roadway at this point. He entered the roadway back here. Here's some samples of you know, what you can do to, to kind of mitigate speeds with outside truck aprons using these flush surfaces, Street Print XD. This has worked very well for us with a couple of roundabouts. Um, another one, this one, we just hatched it with paint and it's cheaper. You know, whatever works best for your site, your community, and maybe the aesthetics you're going for. I, I have a strong preference for the stamped asphalt or maybe even uh, a concrete island that's flush with with the asphalt pavement is fine too and maybe a good choice in some some spots curbing let's talk about what we're using for curbing so on the left side of the roundabout with the splitters i like a four inch mountable curbing and the reason for that is if you have an emergency vehicle approaching the roundabout some drivers will get confused you're supposed to continue through the roundabout and exit and then pull over some drivers may pull to the right and stop along the curb. If you make the inside curb rounded and mountable and only four inches, a fire truck, an ambulance, they can get a couple wheels up on this thing and go by. And I, I think that's a nice benefit to have. It's a little more forgiving on the tires. On the right side, 
I'm designing more for speed control and I want to force people to slow down where I start using the curbing, which is basically within the limits of the splitter island. So I'm using a six inch vertical granite curbing um, and I believe it does have a bearing on speed control and help to get people to slow down by the yield. Let me go back with that. I don't know if I have it later in the presentation, so I want to note, note here. If you do use the six inch granite curbing, there's a couple different configurations you can use. One of them has a rounded surface, and I think I do have it later in the presentation, but keep an eye on that. If you use the square edge curbing, they're pretty hard on tires. They've got quite a reputation for popping tires. There's stuff all over the internet about it. And if you get one of those winters where conditions are a little slippery and someone's coming through here and the road's slippery and they bump into the curb, if you've got that sharp 90 degree corner on the curbing and they hit that with the sidewall of the tire, it will pop the tire. And you know we don't want people popping tires in the roundabout. We want them to clear the roundabout, have it operate efficiently. Um, in the truck apron on the center, we're, we're using a two inch elevation that's mountable, two inch lip that's mountable. I'm using granite. I found good success in granite holding up to the plows and traffic. Concrete does not hold up that well for, for the center islands here. It's something that's gonna be a maintenance headache for a long time. I recommend do not use concrete curbing through here. It's worth the money to put in the granite because you'll never have to touch it again two inch mountable height on the truck apron. In the back where you have the landscape features, I'm providing curbing most of the time. Um, per federal highway, they really do not like to have a vaulting surface here where someone can hit this and vault. So just be cognizant of that. The intent of the curbing has to twofold here for me when I'm designing roundabouts. One is to hold the landscaping and keep keep mulch and topsoil and runoff and stuff from, from spilling out onto the, to the central island. So it's a bit of a, a retaining wall barrier. I put that in, but it also, especially on the smaller roundabouts, it does deter truck traffic from driving through it. If you don't provide any type of barrier here, curbing with a grade separation and you get an aggressive truck driver, there's no deterrent from him for him to avoid, to just run off hit this hard, run off the truck apron and just plow through your landscaping. So, you know, I believe this does help to maintain the integrity of the landscaping, keep the trucks where they need to be. Um, they are, they, they will shy away from a six inch curb. If you have high speed environments, you might want to consider using a four inch mountable curb here instead of the six inch granite. I think it will still serve the purpose and, and help out. But, um, you know, you have my thoughts on it and why I did what I did. But if you don't use any curbing at all, you, you really run the risk of aggressive truck drivers plowing through here. It, it will happen. It's going to happen anyway, but if, if you put the curbing, it's a deterrent. Um, a little more on the curbing. So here's the mountable curb that we're using on the left side, showing that four inch. It's rounded. The splitter islands, I like making these flush. That's a new practice we started, but the nose of the splitter island to taper these down with the pavement. That way when the plow is coming along at night, they've got this tapered edge to ride up on. It's more forgiving for the plow driver, a little easier for them and, and the equipment if they make a mistake. Here's that rounded curbing I was talking about, six inch vertical height, but you've, you've got that buzzed edge and you call for that on your details. It doesn't cost a lot more money to do that. And you won't have articles in the paper about pop tires at your roundabout in the winter time. If you use concrete and try to save money, this is what you can expect. Plow drivers are gonna hit it, trucks are gonna hit it. You, you get pieces busted out. It gets scraped up over the year by the plows. Um, if you wanna try concrete curbing, absolutely make sure you require pre-cast in your contract. That's very important. This is cast in place concrete curbing and per Connecticut DOT specifications, I don't know if it's 818 or 819 we're using now. They they allow poured in place. Whatever you call for concrete can be precast or poured in place when it comes to curbing. Uh, this contractor chose the option to pour in place because of so much curvature. You didn't have to custom order every little piece. And when you pour a curbing in place, the first thing that happens, the truck shows up on the job with the concrete. It's thick. These are a really small form work. You have to put the concrete in. 
he adds water. The foreman on the site adds water. Now you've changed the water cement ratio. You've weakened the mix substantially and they're adding water to it, to it getting it soupy to get it in the forms and get it workable. Um, curbing, it, it, it doesn't tend to get cured for like a bridge deck in the field with proper um, burlapping and keeping it wet. So you get a bunch of things working against you when you do precast curbing in the field. You know, you've, you've got water cement ratio problems because of water added on the site. You, you get poor curing practices in the field just because it's curbing. It's not a, a structure. They just don't tend to get looked after as well. You get you get a weakened design and you can expect breakage and maintenance problems for a very long time. Guaranteed. Use granite. It's worth it. More examples of concrete, what you can expect breaking up over the years because of plow traffic. If this was precast curbing, I don't think we would have had the same result. Um, I think that would have been a little better. Now in the precasting yard, I, I talked about what happens in the field with the cement truck showing up and the water going in. But in the precasting field, you end up with premium conditions, right? You've, you've got a plant where stuff is poured, the mix design is perfect, you've got temperature control that's perfect, you've got humidity and moisture control that's perfect. You can expect to get 6,000 PSI out of, out of cast in place curbing, but you're not going to get that with precast. You're probably lucky if you get 2,500 PSI if that with, um, I mean, cast in place curbing. So anyway, my advice, use granite. You won't have any problems. It'll last forever. <clears throat> the splitter islands with the uh, landscaping, I love this flexi pave stuff. Um, it's held up well. It's worked good for us at DOT or, or similar suitable products. Why do I use this? If you're putting in the street trees, it promotes traffic calming. I'm supportive of those. It gives some visual strength along the road, help with traffic calming. You know, your next thought would be, well, I'm going to put in a mulch bed around this and have some wood chips. Eventually, it's going to rain. The wood chips flow, especially if there's any kind of a grade or you have them an island, you get a lot of storm water in there. It floats the wood chips. They're going to be along the gutter. You got a mess. The weeds grow up through the wood chips after a couple of years. Um, this flexi paved product, it's, it's a porous material. It's made up of rubber tires that are ground up, uh, a glue aggregate and some stones. You could drive on it. They design park. They, they build parking lots out of this stuff. So they haven't done roads with it, but parking lots seem to work pretty well. So if you need to get an emergency vehicle with tires up on it, you're not going to get the rutting you would with mulch. Um, it, you get longevity and you don't get the weed problems. And if you have to replace the tree in the future, you just saw cut a small patch around it, cut out what you need just to put the tree in, put the new tree in and move ahead. There are liquids available of similar products that, that you can buy at basically Home Depot and you could pour in here and match up and patch that if you wanted, or just leave the small rectangular opening. It's not a big deal, but a great product to consider for um, reduced maintenance in the future on your design and, and, and also enhanced uh, aesthetics at your roundabout design. Keep an eye on your truck aprons. Um, you know, some sites will require a pretty large truck apron, depending on the design vehicle that you have. Certain cases, you may have uh, oversized overweight routes that you might want to check. Is your is your roundabout on an oversized overweight permit route? You want to be aware of that. And if it is, you might need to design for that. I, I've worked on one in Ellington, Connecticut, where we had that, and also one in Killingworth, Connecticut, where that was suggested to us as a need. And our truck apron, I think, is 22 feet wide because of that. So the WB62 really only needs about the first six feet of it, but when the permit vehicle comes through, they need the rest of it. So in one case, we went with these grass, with these um, concrete paver blocks. These, I think these were um, ideal paver blocks and they, they worked out pretty well. They held up well. They've been there at least 10 years now and we've had pretty good success with them. You know, the green just kind of breaks up the aesthetics a little bit, makes it look a little better. Because when you get 22 feet of concrete, it doesn't look so great. So, you know, if, if you get into that situation, you might want to look at changing the colors of the concrete or changing the materials just, just to uh, break that up. But um, concrete has been our preferred product to use for truck aprons at DOT. Some states are using asphalt, stamped asphalt, you know, for, for your client, whatever they want to deal with for maintenance, you, you can do that. It's all suitable. 
for longevity, if we use the concrete, you know you're not going to have to touch it for probably 30 years. Um, stamped asphalt, you might get 10, 12, 15 years out of it, and then you got to go back and redo it. But concrete, I would think at, at least 30 years. And, and then maybe when you have to redo it, it's just a surface treatment. Okay, safety for all users. Why we like roundabouts. Um, motorist pulls up the roundabout. He looks to the left, looks basically what's in front of him, looks to the left. If he gets a gap, he goes. Roundabouts are pretty easy to, to design and drive. I mean, you got a vehicle pulling up here. He looks to his left, looking for a gap, and, and he goes. And we also have sidewalks around the roundabout. We talked about that. And we want good sight lines and we want to accommodate our pedestrians. So the crosswalks that are roundabout are designed to be behind the vehicle. And if you look at this other picture, see where the vehicle is? The crosswalk is behind the vehicle. At a conventional intersection, the crosswalk is in front of the vehicle. And this is intended so that while well, this driver pulls up to the circular roadway and, and he's looking at vehicles approaching him from the left, He's not worried about a pedestrian stepping off the curb ramp. He doesn't have to because the pedestrian's behind him. So with this driver's in the decision-making process, and he's pretty busy looking at cars coming from his left, because he's going to look to his right. What's he? Look to your left, look to your right, then look left again. That's how we were taught to drive, right? So you took your eyes off the right, and you go to, to make your maneuver. And at signalized intersections, there's been a number of pedestrian hits where a ped walked off the curb ramp in front of a car that was just about to turn. So you don't have that with the roundabout. Um, the crosswalks behind the first car, 20 feet back per the manual. That's what they require. That gives you distance enough to put the car in. Ped goes back here. The ped's crossing out of the decision-making process that happens in the front and enhances safety. And this is how pedestrians cross roundabouts. You got your crosswalk. You've got your island of refuge in the middle. The nice thing about roundabouts and pedestrians, you only have to cross one leg at a time. So you go off the curb ramp, cross one section of the roadway, you've got a refuge island, you can stand here. Well, now you wait for a gap in the other direction. If this island wasn't here, well, you've got to cross two lanes of traffic at one time. You need a much bigger gap, and it might take you a lot longer to cross the roadway to find that gap. You don't have that with a roundabout. Roundabouts are safer. You go out to the to the refuge island, wait for a gap in the other direction, and go. You've only got to cross one lane at a time. That's a big selling point for pedestrian safety. Here's my buddy Zach. He's going to demonstrate that. So he's familiar with roundabouts and how they work. You get all this traffic approaching from this direction, if this was a signalized intersection, Zach probably wouldn't be crossing the roadway or even side street stop control, maybe not. But, you know, he, he knows he's got a gap here. He's going to go. He's got his refuge island here. He can stop and then he can wait for a gap in the other direction. He's not concerned. So always provide sidewalks at roundabouts, at least always consider them. That's a strong message I want you guys to take away today. Always consider sidewalks at roundabouts. Here's a roundabout that doesn't have sidewalks. And, and I'm responsible for this one too. And when we first designed this, I was the project engineer. I treated this like any other intersection, signalized intersection. I said, well, there's no sidewalk leading up to it. So we probably won't put sidewalks through the intersection. And I regret that. And here's the reason I'll walk you through that. Just one of my lessons learned. If you look at the edge striping here, it's not a shoulder. That's what this is. It's edge striping. It's not a shoulder in the context that you would have on a conventional roadway. To the top of the photo, you can see the edge striping. There's a shoulder. You got about four feet there where a person could walk or bicycle if they needed to. But once you get into the roundabout, that paint is just in visibility. It's just an edge line for visibility to help people get through, especially at night, glass beads. It's not a shoulder. The other thing that happens is we, we saw the turning maneuvers of the truck when they go through here from auto turn. They use all available pavement. There's not a shoulder here like you would have with a tangent section of roadway or right angled intersection. And if you don't provide the sidewalks, this is what happens. You end up with people out on your truck apron walking across the intersection. In this case, we do have sidewalks and they did it anyway. 
but you can guarantee if you don't have sidewalks, this is what's going to happen. And what happens when the tractor trailer's coming around here and the rear wheels are up on the truck apron and the guy's pushing hard and maybe he's a little tired. And then the pedestrian is, this guy's basically in the roadway with his back turned to traffic. And that's, that's not good. So back to my example with, you know, why we want sidewalks, there's no shoulders on a roundabout. Look at the path the truck takes, this swept path. He uses all available pavement. This is not a place where you want your kids to be walking or riding their bike. Most people wouldn't think of when a larger vehicle comes through that they use that much. They'll see the paint, they'll think, oh, I'm in the shoulder, I'm fine. Not really. And if you look at, in practice, the actual a hardware truck down here in the bottom left, you can see the bumper of that truck. It's, it's overhanging the curb line. He's using all available pavement to get through. And that's how we designed it when we pulled the truck through. We didn't allow a, a buffer area next to the roadway for pedestrians. They're supposed to be on the sidewalk. This is one of those raised um, in outside truck aprons that we had that I talked about. And, and this site, you needed it. There was nothing you could do to, to avoid it. This was needed for fastest path, speed control. And, and you'll have that at, at times because of the angles of the approaching roadway. But now you have the knowledge to make the right choice. But I put this in there just for example. This is, this is not where you want your children standing waiting across the road because that's what happens when a truck comes through. And if they walked out to the center of the roundabout, and you were walking on this thing, your kids are walking or pushing a bike, you don't want them there. And this particular roundabout, when we first started looking at it, there wasn't really a destination for pedestrians to go. We didn't really notice pedestrians out there that would warrant a sidewalk either. The town didn't bring it up. But after it was built, like I said, I'm kind of a roundabout nut. I go out and I watch traffic of these things observe and I learn these lessons and I bring them back to you guys so we can all do better next time. What I noticed was a half day of school and a bunch of little kids, couple with a bicycle, and they were going down to the convenience store, uh, the gas station here to buy ice creams or sodas or something. And they had to get through the intersection and we didn't provide them a place to go. And it, and it scared me. So lesson learned, always consider sidewalks at your roundabouts, always. Public involvement. Um, you need a little bit more robust plan for public involvement than you would a conventional intersection. You know, bring in your landscape architects to help you with that. You, you can do some pencil sketches. You can do uh, larger degree renderings like this. Um, also, when you're putting hours on your job at, at the beginning, make sure you put hours on for landscaping early on in the design because this is something you want to bring to the public involvement and you're going to need your landscape design to go as part of your visualization. So roundabouts are much more labor intensive up front than a typical intersection and make sure you account for that for your hours and your scope. Features that will make the project attractive, you know, include those in your visualization, have conversations with your municipality about what do they want the center island to look like? They're going to have to maintain this stuff. A lot of towns want gateway signing, uh, flag poles, different treatments, traffic modeling, another component that can help sell your project at public involvement. You know, you can see over here, we're running side street stop control. You got some queuing going on. Um, looking over to the left, you're running a roundabout, you know, simultaneously. It shows the queuing kind of cleared out a little quicker than it did with the side street stop control. It also shows, you know, speed control through the intersection. You know, VISM's not perfect, but it, it definitely can help. This type of modeling is, is definitely beneficial in controversial areas. I wouldn't say you have to do it everywhere. Certainly not required everywhere, especially in communities where you already have a roundabout nearby. You probably don't need to go to this level, but if you have a, a expectation of a controversial project, hard to sell, maybe an area where there isn't a roundabout, this is money well spent and, and I'll, I say that because this project went through with one public meeting because we kind of went in up front with everything we needed to uh, communicate well the public. I've had other roundabouts where it took four public meetings to get through the public involvement process. Those four public meetings were a lot more expensive than the visualization we spent on that one job. 
But, you know, for some projects, this is all you need. You know, this is an architectural rending, probably, probably done by your, your landscape architect. Th these are just pastel colors. This is something that could be done in a couple days and it's very low cost. And it really communicates the project very well to your, your client and your stakeholder groups. You know, and you can have before and afters. This sometimes this is all you really need. But you need something, right? Don't don't go to public involvement without some type of visualization tool to communicate to the public of what this is really going to look like. Because because that's important. Roundabouts are 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 very context sensitive, and the visualization part of it's very important to the community and businesses that are are looking at you know do they think this is is good for their neighborhood or not? You know, and these before and after type renderings. This is just a a Google Street View image combined with a, a landscape architect pastel rendering, very, very powerful in, in uh, communicating what the project will look like. All right, let's talk about construction a little bit. We talked about um, planning, design, stakeholder involvement, you know, and everybody in the front end of the process, but it's, it's pretty important to get everyone on the back end um, educated on roundabouts as well. And that includes our construction staff, our construction inspectors, and our contractors. Because what can happen, and people don't understand how the roundabout's supposed to work, we can end up with safety problems during construction that, that create eyesores uh, on the overall product and, and operational problems. So, you know, I thought this was pretty funny. This contractor threw a portal out in the middle of Splitter Island. That's really not where I would want to put that for my guys, um, considering traffic approaching on either side, but, you know, it worked out, I guess. Um, maybe he didn't want them spending too much time in the can on the job, but, you know, these are things that can happen, right? So anyone see anything wrong with this? You know, we, we've got these pavement markings here that just look a little funky, um, and we have you know, this wasn't caught during construction. This was this was caught a little bit later. So, you know, this is this happens because staff are not familiar with roundabouts yet. They're they're new to us as designers and practitioners, and they're new to our construction folks too. So we all need to work together. And for roundabout projects, I would suggest the design team spend a little bit more time on the construction job than you normally would just to look out for things like this and make sure they don't have any problems. So, you know, this pavement marking is is um in the wrong spot right so they've, they've got the right turn going into where you're entering this should have been been back here more um and, and that's you know problem somebody didn't notice the truck aprons are not parking lots right we established this is where the trucks go when, when they get through here and construction staff repeatedly doesn't seem to get it that you need this room for the truck to get on to navigate through during construction and lighting do construction staging plans for all your roundabouts. Figure out where you're going to put traffic. How are you going to build these things? How you how you going to how are you going to build them while the truck apron is green, right? So, in order to get the truck through here, this concrete has to be cured to put the rear wheels of the truck up on it. And if this truck apron is green or it's all rebar, it's excavated. Well, where's the truck going to go? So always do phasing plans, figure out, you know, where your temporary signs are going to go, your pavement markings, um, basically your temporary markings or your final markings, but always consider illumination too. So in this stage construction phase, we don't have any line striping. It's pretty dark. Um, there's not much here except the sea of barrels to help navigate the, the driver through. But what we did is put the final illumination in at the beginning of the project. So now you have street lighting that was intended to go with the roundabout that's already up and running for the construction condition where safety is most critical. So as you're approaching the roundabout, you know, the drivers just kind of got this sea of signs they got to go through. But make sure you have those yield signs. Very important that that goes in. Um, look at the truck turning path during construction as part of your phasing you can see here that that because you can't use the truck apron because it's under construction the swept path of the vehicle is on top of this island well that means guess what we can't build this island we don't want to put in this outside curbing absolutely not that's going to be a problem we don't want to put in the curbing out here so what we might want is some temporary pavement over here that we take out later temporary pavement here maybe we want to just build this last 
and, and that's good advice in your staging plans. And check the movements all the way around, just like you did in design, pretty important. You know, and this kind of gives you a view of what the project might look like through construction, um, considering staging plans. You, you need to provide this to the contractor. And more importantly, you need to make sure they follow them because problems happen when they don't follow them, right? You want to build the nose of these islands last. We just talked about that because the trucks need this area to get through. And I always see barrels out there. They don't seem to always get why the staging plans they are. And in this case, we had pavement that kind of got damaged because it wasn't backed up properly with gravel or temporary pavement. The rear wheels of the truck are going off here, then back on. You're you're getting kind of this raveling. And this is our final pavement. You know, this is your your binder mix. I don't I don't want that. That's that's not what we paid for. So keep an eye on everything in construction. It's pretty important until the rest of our our, our partners are are well versed in in roundabout construction as well as design. You know, and here's the raveling of that pavement. You got this lip. You know, you, you really don't you want to have this area backed up with temporary pavement or gravel. And you can see these barrels are all busted up. Why do you think that is? Well, the rear wheels of the truck went off here. As we showed that in the turning template, they went over the barrels and back up on the pavement and broke it. So, you know, our staging plans didn't show that. You know, our, our staging plans had that taken care of but it wasn't it wasn't followed through in construction and here's another one right um you know truck comes through they're working on the truck apron but somebody put in this curbing which shouldn't have been done yet you know maybe that was should have been done later in the game and they're working on the truck apron and you know truck comes through and you get this kind of rutting these you don't want these kind of problems in a community where there was some opposition to the roundabout to start with because people just turn on and they say, see, we told you it wouldn't work. And that's why it, it's pretty important to keep an eye on these jobs during construction, make sure the phasing plans are followed and a few site visits can go a long way. You know, here's another example of that. This was the one in Salem that we did at 80, 82 and 85. And I was project engineer for the end of this, um, actually project manager for the end of it, I think. But what happened here I went out on the job site and the contractor had actually taken all this curbing. He had built the nose of this island all the way up to here. He didn't backfill it with, with concrete, but he built the island. And then he got into starting on the center island here for the truck apron. And I, I said to the superintendent on the job site, how are you going to get the trucks through? And he, he kind of looked at me like, what are you talking about? And then I explained to him, well, the, the rear wheels have to go up on that apron to get through here. And it's green concrete. It's your work site. How are they going to get through? So, um, what he, he went back immediately. He pulled out the he pulled out the curbing. They put some coal patch in here, um, and and made that suitable. But then you, you know you could see the barrel here. Someone threw the barrel on there, and a truck ran it over. So it's pretty pretty clear the truck needs that area, and that's that's why that was in the staging plans that way. And it, it's probably the third or fourth time I noticed the staging plans were not followed and they were ignored in construction grade think about that on your staging plans well you've just got the binder mixed down we're looking at a two inch curb here finished well what happens when you just got the binder down this could be a six inch curb and if you're planning on trucks need to go up on that to use it during this construction condition and that height is six inches it's not going to work or you're going to get a lot of complaints and damage so you, you might want to use a bituminous wedge here throw down some bond breaker pavement it's very helpful Managing traffic through construction, you can do alternating one way at roundabouts. What you have to do is halt them, the top right picture. You'll halt the traffic at the end of the splitter island on one side, and then maybe a thousand feet down the end of the splitter island, the other side of the roundabout, and, and you send them the wrong way through the roundabout. So you can work on the roundabout this way with alternating one way. Um, you need four flaggers if it's a conventional intersection because you've got to stop traffic at each leg. All four legs, you've got to stop traffic. Just let one direction go at a time. The flaggers got to have radios. They got to communicate, but it can work very well. Now, top right picture, I took this because you could see there's there's cars going in the same direction on both sides of the road. They got to merge in down here. Clearly, that's not good. Right. And the reason that happened is because the contractor set up alternating one way. He only had two flaggers on the job. 
he didn't have anybody to cover the side street. So this car pulled up to the side street and he kind of snuck in and made a right turn. And, you know, he didn't think he was doing anything wrong. And meanwhile, traffic was sent on the wrong side of the roundabout on this side and they got to merge back into that lane. So that's kind of an important thing to understand. Test panels for your stamped concrete, pretty important. There's a lot of general contractors out there that don't have the specialty skill to pour stamped concrete. It is a skill, it's a talent, it takes some experience to get it right. And um, they, they tend to rent panels uh, for the stamp. They rent the stamps and they attempt to do this on their own. And you don't want your project to be the first one they try it on because you can have these kinds of problems. So if you get these kind of problems on a test panel, it's not the end of the world. But write your spec up for your stamp concrete that they're going to build your test panels. Also critical with that, pay for the test panel. If you have something in construction you want done and you don't pay for it, they're not going to do it, right? They're not getting any money for it. There's no incentive to do it. Spend the money, pay them the yardage of concrete. You know, it's worth it. So these are the kinds of problems you can get. And if you do the test panels, make them pour it till they get it right before they do the final product. You know, you, you can get a better result. Integral color on your concrete, pretty important. You know, if it gets if it gets busted, you have that same color throughout. Here's one where you just had a surface stencil and you have that kind of gray concrete underneath that doesn't look so good. Safety statistics, Connecticut has had great luck with our roundabouts. So five roundabouts that we had looked at so far at one point, we found an 81% reduction in severe crashes and a 49% reduction in overall crashes with, with that roundabout program. Very, very successful for safety. Here's a look at a few of them. So this was an existing traffic circle, um, old rotary that we had modified into modern roundabout. And if you look at the geometry coming in, it's very, very tangent geometry. Um, we added some splitter islands, changed the alignment just a little bit, got this curvilinear geometry here. We implored more deflection, um, significant safety benefits. We, DOT got an award for that one. 70% reduction in crashes and a 90% reduction in injuries by bringing that old rotary up to a modern, modern roundabout design. And here's that 148 foot diameter running low on time. So I'm gonna flip through some of this kind of quick. You know, this one, this was uh, deemed to be, this was side street stop control deemed to be upgraded for a traffic signal. DOT went with the roundabout design. We reduced crashes by 70%, reduced injuries by 77%. Guys, huge safety benefits, 106 feet diameter. Um, this one's Ellington, Route 74 and 286. This was side street stop control for five legs. This thing was kind of the wild west out here as far as who got through the intersection quickly. Uh, who got through the intersection first was the more aggressive driver. The delay was terrible. It was four minutes of delay in the peak hour and the PM getting through there. Put in the roundabout. This wasn't really about addressing crashes that were already there, but we did get some safety benefits. 38% uh, reduction crashes, 80% reduction in injury crashes, but this one was more of a capacity project to reduce that delay that was there. And uh, we, we certainly did that. This roundabout works great. A lot of air, people in the community talk about how successful that was. 148 foot diameter on that one. Probably one of our biggest successes, Route 82 and 85 in Salem, Connecticut, removing the existing signalized intersection. This one was already built out. It had a lot of turning lanes. This thing was congested terribly at the PM peak hour. Beach traffic on Saturdays was terrible. Uh, the safety problems were awful. That location had 22 crashes a year with about nine injuries before construction. We put in the roundabout. We reduced crashes by 50% and we reduced injuries by 90%, severe injuries by 90%. Huge success right there. Great, great project, 130 feet. Um, this one in Seymour, again, you know, look at the existing condition. There's no deflection coming in. This was an old rotary, um, a lot of safety concerns due to high speeds coming through here. We basically modernized it with some geometry, some curbing, the splitter islands, followed the manual and, and um, you know, we got some safety benefit there too. Although the crash, the numbers of crashes were not high, they were there. And, and you know, maybe we helped out somebody in that community not, not to go to the hospital. 126 feet foot diameter on that one. 
Um, Monroe, Connecticut, this was side street stop control, Route 111 at 110. So stop control on the side street with a flashing beacon, large queues in, in the peak hour on that side street. It was very difficult for vehicles on the side street to, to enter Route 111 because of the speeds primarily people were traveling on Route 111 in addition to the volumes, but hard for people to get a gap. The queuing was terrible. You were getting aggressive maneuvers with short gaps and crash problems associated with that, which were very concerning to the community. That location had nine crashes a year before construction. We dropped that down to three crashes. So 67% reduction in crashes, 61% reduction in injuries, big success, 140 foot diameter. One we just finished, um, Notch Road and Route 202 in Granby. Again, side street stop control, convert to a modern roundabout. I don't have data on that for crashes yet, but I can tell you operationally, it works significantly better than the side street stop control. We have reduced speeds. I know we have improved safety. It's a definitely a success. 133 foot diameter. I don't want to leave this presentation without commenting a little bit on multi-lane roundabouts. Um, I focused the entire presentation on single lane roundabouts because there's there's only so much time we have. It's really important early on to determine how many lanes you need at your roundabout. Multi-lane roundabouts can be successful, can be better than the existing solution, but they're not necessarily the easy home run uh, project as a single lane roundabout would be. With multi-lanes, you end up with higher speeds on the approaches. Um, you end up with more conflict points. Drivers get in the wrong lane. They get confused. What lane am I supposed to be in? You get people trying to change lanes in the middle. That's typically what results in the crashes on the multi-lanes. But it's there. It happens. And if you build one, it's, it's going to happen at that site. So you want to evaluate the number of lanes you need early on to make sure that the roundabout is the right solution for your site before you initiate the project, before you get the 30% and you make commitments to the community and then later find out, oh yeah, we really needed some more lanes and we need more right away. And maybe is this really the safety solution that's going to work here? And, you know, in some cases, maybe the existing traffic signal is the right way to go. And maybe you just put in a turning lane for low cost and move ahead for a while. Um, the other point I would make with this is that the the community, let's say the roundabout community, has really adopted a philosophy of right sizing roundabouts, which means you might not necessarily design these things for 20 years, excuse me, 20 years in the future. Maybe look at what volumes you have five years in the future, your construction year, a little beyond that, and try to get some reasonable level of 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 duration and service out of it, and then maybe get people familiar with how to drive the roundabout, and then maybe consider adding the additional lane in the future if you actually need it. But during the design process, move the utilities for the multi-lane, buy the right-of-way for the multi-lane, so that if you add have to add the extra lane, it's just a curbing and pavement job, and, and it's not necessarily the, the full rebuild of the intersection. And I got a video for you, kind of a nice wrap up. This is uh, Monroe, Connecticut, the roundabout we, we looked at earlier, Route 110 and 111. We've got a nice drone video. Uh, Vitaly Starverov in our office did this. He's, he's a photographer and also a drone pilot. And this is what you could have for your clients or in your community as a roundabout. So we've got the truck apron. Landscape Center Island, helping with screening visibility through through the roundabout, traffic operating very efficiently. You know, if that was side street stop controlled, you would have seen a lot of delay, and and you just you didn't have that. You know, these cars pull up and they go. You know, look look to the left. There's no one coming. They go, and some of that's because the speeds are much lower. You know, the lower speeds are helping with with efficiency here. Here's that truck that was spilling the gravel on the grade I was talking about. He's, he's, he's light there, but when he's loaded, he was dumping the gravel on that corner because he's crossing the grade. Snow shelf, that's very important. Don't put your sidewalk right next to the curb. School bus does not go up on the truck apron. Remember that. Buses, any passengers, don't go up on the truck apron. 
these things work like a clock. Here's your WB62. This is actually a WB67. I can see the rear wheels. He's got to push the head, how long that trailer is. It goes up on the apron. It works beautifully. No problems. Nice long splitter islands, plenty of speed control. That's what you're going for. You got 40, 50 mile an hour speeds coming into that, 200 foot splitter islands, helping with your traffic calming so that by the time you get to the yield, you're slowed down. You don't want to end up with all your braking right at the yield line. And we have community connectivity with this project. You've got nice sidewalks all the way around that connect to the historic district in Monroe that wasn't there before. The pedestrians only have to cross one leg of the road at a time. You've got the refuge islands in the middle. And I think that's it, kids. All right, Scott, thanks a lot. That's a great presentation. Um, thanks for doing it. Do you have time for questions or? Do I do. Oh, you do? Yep. Yep. All right. Very good. So we'll uh, we'll open it up to questions. If anybody has a question, you could use the little raise your hand thing in the upper right corner um, or, you know, type in a question and uh, and I can read it off. We could do that. Let me get to the chat to see if we've got anything going on. Nobody has any questions. I think I put him to sleep. There we go. Uh, Bull's got a question that showed up. Let's see. Oh, wait. Look at this one. Why don't you go ahead, unmute yourself, a bull, and have at it? A great presentation. I like it. You know, I, I joined a little later, but it was so uh, illuminating about the effectiveness of uh, roundabouts you know in in our cities and in our towns so, you know, especially um areas in connecticut where it can be it can be constructed and, and improve uh, life you know for the residents and others around it but the one question i have uh, that you know that why would somebody consider with the dual lane um you know if there is a traffic uh, signal there already with dual lanes what are the pros and cons um, of considering a dual lane roundabout, which is going to be tricky, as you said, that people get confused and you know, Scott said that, you know. So is there any 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 tool or criteria to to accept or, or to consider uh, a signalized improvement of intersection, adding a left turn lane, for example, then going full blown with a with two lane on each on all of the legs that is coming out uh, to go with the roundabout on a two lane uh, you know, double lane highway you know, rather than it works definitely perfectly well for single lane. But why would somebody consider that uh, if uh, one has a signalized intersection with the traditional approach of adding a, a left, uh, you know, bay or, you know, left turn on any of those things that has a traffic? What are the pros and cons of that? You know, that's the question for Scott. Okay, so it, it that's kind of a, a long question to answer. I'm going to do my best because there's, there's a couple <laughs> of different points there that you got to think of. Number one, just because the existing signalized intersection has multiple lanes on the approach, you might have a through lane and a left turn lane, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna need that with the roundabout. So we don't wanna make an assumption that an existing intersection that's signalized that has multiple lanes is still going to need those lanes at a roundabout. Because what happens is you, you gotta do a traffic analysis and, and vet that and be sure because what happens is the roundabouts operate much more efficiently than a traffic signal. With a traffic signal, you have a lot of delay. You know, you're stopping traffic, it's queuing up, the additional lanes are there to store traffic in, in that lane assignment while it's queuing up while other legs are moving or the pedestrians have their phase. Well, with a roundabout, you don't really have that. It works differently. Traffic pulls up, they look to the left. If they got a gap, they go. So you might find a lot of intersections today that have a left turn lane in addition to a through lane. When you do your traffic capacity analysis, you can get by with a single lane roundabout. So, you know, just keep that in mind. We don't want to jump to the assumption that we'll already need a multi lane roundabout just because there's multi lanes there today. More often than not, you probably can get by with a single lane roundabout. And, and then you want to consider 
well, maybe it works for a single lane roundabout in the near future. May maybe we want to build the extra lanes much later to try to get the safety benefits out of the single lane and, and maybe ease an operation early on, get the community used to the single lane roundabout. And then as volumes increase in the future, if we really if that really happens and if we really need the extra lanes, we could always put them in later. So so that's part of it. The other part of the question is, well, if you already had an existing intersection with a signal and left turn lanes, you know, why would you just throw in a modern roundabout? Well, you know, why spend the money in infrastructure? These are expensive. The ones that we built in Connecticut, they're they're probably ranging one and a half to three million dollars. Um, I know Norwich just did one. I got to give them a lot of credit. They just did one for about 600,000 in construction where they used basically the existing pavement and they didn't do any full depth and they tried to save the drainage that was there and, you know, used as much of the existing infrastructure as possible. And they got a really nice roundabout in for 600,000. But to go back and answer your question, it's about safety. So if you have that existing intersection and it's got through lanes and left turn lanes, you know, why are you even looking at it? You're probably looking at it to start with. It's either got a safety problem or it's got an operation problem. And operation may be improved significantly by going to a single lane roundabout because you're eliminating a lot of the delay. Well, safety might too. The intersection at the bottom left corner here in Salem, that this was originally signalized, that had something like 22 crashes a year with, with nine injuries or something. It, it was... It was a, a big number on, on our list of high crash locations. Um, and, and we were able to reduce severe crashes substantially by improve, by, by constructing a roundabout and overall crashes by something like 50%. So the safety benefits are why you would put the roundabout in, but possibly also capacity. Very good. Very good explanation. I'm clear. Scott, I'm going to first uh, ask one of the questions that came in under text uh, or messaging. Roger Cron asked, has the state constructed any mini roundabouts with a fully traversable center island? We have not yet, but I'm all supportive of it. Um, I believe those will work very well in Connecticut in urban environments, low speed environments. That's where I wanna see them used. And, and if we have an opportunity to put one in somewhere, I, I'm definitely supportive of it, but I would not use it on a rural state arterial where the speeds are pretty high. You know, you wanna use it in an area that already has good speed control because of other features in the area to start with. Those will work very well in a downtown area where speeds are already low because what, ha what happens is with the mini roundabouts that don't have a center island and fully traversable, you really don't get the deflection you do out of a, a, a full roundabout um, because it's traversable. So you don't get the speed control out of it, but you do get significantly better operation than you would with a stop control or, or, or traffic signal. Very so good. That, that's why I'd want to start with a low speed environment. So some something that has other features in the area that are already reducing speeds. Mm. And in that case, I think it would be great if, you know, especially if you had a T intersection, that's a great spot for one of those because you mm. don't have the through movements, you know. Right. All right. Uh, Kevin Ellis asked, has there been any investigation on the use of turbo roundabouts as an alternative to the multi lane? Yes, and DOT is currently, I'd say, evaluating a design like that on, on another location that we have uh, in the design team right now. So, yeah, that's that's something that we're, we're looking into. And, and just to quickly um, touch on that, the turbo roundabout is it's when you enter the roundabout and you basically spiral your way out and it forces you um, out at a certain location, right? Yes. Okay. It, it, you know, you're holding the lane assignment, you know, you, you set up in the right lane, you, you stay with it all the way through, and it, it kind of forces you to stay in that location all the way to the exit. Very good. All right. I saw there was another hand up, Jeremy, but I guess he's all set. He must. I don't see any other questions. Yeah. He, he answered my question in his response to a bull. Great. 
you know, back to Abdul's, Thank you very much. <laughs> Abul's question, you know, it, it's also about safety for all users. You get significant pedestrian safety and crossing benefits with the roundabout as, as well as for your cycling community that, you know, yeah. you wouldn't have maybe to the same degree with a signalized intersection. Yes, I have seen the benefits. There was a lot of skeptics in the own town that I live, you know, my own town, Glastonbury, on the Hebron Avenue, there was a lot of ruckus, you know, for the construction of the roundabout at the intersection where, uh, you know, Hebron Avenue is meeting the new London Turnpike, you know, uh, Whole Foods and all that, if you know. So I saw through the whole, lived through that whole thing in my own town, but finally people have accepted it. It has, it has, you know, it has improved the overall thing. And it's a one land uh, thing, you know, you, they used to be before. So what you're trying to, what you're saying is makes a lot of sense that the efficiency of the movement uh, does not change a lot from, uh, you know, if you convert two lanes into, a, you know, a roundabout into a one lane, which is much more efficient and practical, it does not change, at least for the projected, you know, five year, 10 year projection of traffic uh, yeah. that will happen, you know, so with, it's with good. It. At the end of the day, there was a lot of opposition, but finally I drive by it every now and then, and uh, it has got all the features that you just described. You can ride over the over the ramp, you know, the, the truck uh, ramp area and all that, and it's easily rideable even if you are, you know, handling a car around it and it works, you know. <clears throat> it, that significantly reduced traffic delay in Glastonbury. Yeah. Those were big successes. The intersection at New London Turnpike, at the PM peak hour on New London Turnpike, you could expect to sit at that signal for two cycles of the signal to get through. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, I know. That's, it's, the traffic is gone. It's not like that anymore. Everything's flowing. You know, the benefits of roundabout is that a lot of maneuvers, a lot of movements can all happen concurrently. Yeah. That there are often closed at a, a signalized intersection to allow other movements to happen safely because they're crossing movements. You're eliminated the crossing movements with the roundabout. And that's what allows you to run more legs at the same time. Absolutely. There was a lot of opposition. That's what I'm going to tell you. Uh, you know, when the project came out from the Hartford, you know, the Glastonbury community, including me and my wife and others and all that, they said, we're going to slow down the traffic. What's what they're doing over there? And the construction period also was not very easy. It lasted quite quite a bit long, which, you know, that the so constructability and, 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 and getting the right contractor for more, uh, you know, sensitive projects, which is a lot of traffic and all that is also something very important. How he does, you know, does his uh, staging with regard to what it is. You know, contractors very easy to switch their a, a staging that is, you know, recommended in the contract docs and all that just for their convenience. So it, it, it but does put the residents through a lot of inconvenience during construction also, you know. We have found roundabouts to be very good for business. The one that we built in West Haven, Immediately after we we built it, one corner, um, like a, a new convenience store gas station was built and right. was very successful after the roundabout was done. The one in Ellington, they put in a Dunkin' Donuts after the roundabout was built. The one in Salem, a Dunkin' Donuts went in in the corner right after the roundabout was built. You know, th these business chains know what's going to be successful and what's not. They wouldn't put their business there if, you know, if they had doubts about people avoiding the area because of the roundabout or or traffic congestion being there. So, you know, they know we've we've seen a lot of positive business improvements at the roundabout locations. Absolutely. Fantastic presentation, I must say, once more. Uh, thank, Eric, thank you for uh, inviting me for this presentation. I learned a lot, you know, Eric Jarbo. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, um, Mike Fisher asked how many two lane roundabouts uh, the DOT has constructed. I think that's zero, but. So yeah, we, we don't actually have any any two full two lanes. So I'll, it's a good question. I'll clarify that. And I didn't do a good job of that in my presentation. But if you look at the bottom left of my screen, what we have here are two lanes on one approach. That's called a hybrid roundabout. You don't actually get to a, a full two lane roundabout until you have two circulating lanes. And that's where you get into the increased the increased safety concerns and conflict points with weaving within the roundabout, people getting in the wrong lane. Um, the, the two full circulating lanes becomes a point at which you really want to ask yourself, why am I building a roundabout? What is my existing problem I'm trying to solve? And, and am I going to solve the problem with the roundabout? And in some cases, the answer is going to be yes, and the roundabout is the right choice. And then in some cases, you might you might decide just staying with the signal a little longer is a better way to go. 
Very good. I, I'll quickly uh, just share, um, uh, just in line with Abul's original question about, you know, why would you consider a roundabout and what are, you know, the benefits? There's already a signal. There was a project that the DOT has uh, ongoing in design right now. It's at about 30% design. It's 6160 and had them, and there's two roundabouts. This was a, um, a project I had actually initiated back when I was at DOT and uh, and uh, Joe Arsenault's the project manager now. Uh, Joe Jazowitz is the lead designer. They're doing a fantastic job. They did the public informational meeting and those two roundabouts, it's the, the southern one, it's at it's at 82 and 154 and the southern one, it's a T intersection. It's it's really stemmed from operational problems more so than anything else. There was a heavy volume of right turning vehicles um, on, on the through movement and that would cause hesitancy for people making a left out of 82 onto 154 and sometimes they would they would go in anticipation of someone making a left or making a right turn and then they would you know potentially either get hit or or close to it I've seen all kinds of crazy operations happening there just from driver frustration. So that roundabout will clear that up a lot. And then at the northern one where 82 and 154 separate again, there is um, that has an existing signal and they were looking at a signal project. And I pretty much knew based on the operations and everything and the volumes, they were going to be adding turn lanes. So here you are, you've got a um, you know, single lane approaches with a little bit of bypass and they were going to probably need to add in dedicated turn lanes and widen out the intersection rather than do that. If they now install a roundabout, it will work just fine for now, probably good for another 20 years into the future without much problem as well. Uh, so that was and then that adds all those other benefits of, you know, the safety, the pedestrian safety, cyclists, 154 is a scenic route. Um, so it's it's um, a lot of cyclists use it. There's also, um, you know, the benefits of just the aesthetics. It really kind of looked nice in the area, as Scott mentioned a bunch of times with the Center Island. So um, I think that project, if you get a chance, you could, you know, look up on the state website, 6160, they have the uh, the public information all like the color plan up there and it looks really nice. Um, Jeremy's got a question. Go ahead. Shoot. Yeah, so I guess in terms of. Uh, you know, trying to, to help. People, I guess, understand when we're in when we're in a position where, you know, we may have not not have been asked to look at a roundabout or something, but we're trying to solve a, a, a problem where we're looking at an area and we feel like a roundabout might be an, a good solution in a in a particular location. <laughs> Sometimes we find that there's a hesitancy to even consider a roundabout. So um, is, is there any do you have any suggestions or uh, key words that that could help? You know, to get others to, to consider them more readily, or is that kind of more just on us to to, to try to figure a way to sell them better, because there's there I think I feel like one of the the idea about the the increases in efficiency through the the or the better operation through the increases in efficiency is is hard to explain if you're not not familiar with how that works and sometimes that takes more time than we have to to explain in a in an initial meeting or something like that. Yep. Yeah. So a, a resource that you might have for an initial meeting is is the federal federal highway website has some informational brochures on roundabouts and it, it talks about how roundabouts are are more efficient for all users more safe for all users that's something that could be just used at an introductory meeting um, to, to explain the benefits of roundabouts and then you also have the the speed factor you know um we talked about pedestrians and and how much better roundabouts are for pedestrians because we're reducing speeds down to under 25 miles an hour so that's a that's a good selling point the aesthetics is a good selling point um the, the lack of having to maintain a signal system in the future is is a good selling point the other thing that you might want to talk about and i, I didn't cover it too much in the presentation is that the roundabouts work significantly better in the off peak hours than a traffic signal. We designed the signal for peak hour and that that's where the phasing is set up with the roundabout. 
it, you're, it's going to work significantly better in the off peak hour. You know, how many times are you at a signalized intersection and there's not, you know, the cars that were there, they cleared their cycle. There's nobody else there, but you're still in the signal cycle and you got to wait your turn. And you probably waited 15 seconds and there was no reason to wait. You don't have that at a roundabout. You pull up, you look to your left, it's clear, you go. The power goes out, the roundabouts work. But, you know, as, as far as um, a resource, Federal Highway's got some stuff on their website that can be useful. Um, to, to really talk about the traffic benefits well, you, you almost need to run a VISM simulation so you can show to somebody how much better that location will work with a signal versus a roundabout in a, in a traffic simulation. But that's something you probably wouldn't have the resources to do up front in early concept development. But you, you definitely, there is some information online, the Federal Highway website. Some other DOTs have quite a bit of information about um, the benefits of roundabouts. Uh, Connecticut DOT has some of that also on our website. There's a couple of, of colorful brochures and handouts that talk about the benefits of roundabouts. We actually just did something in September of this year for National Roundabout Week, and we sent out an informational flyer talking about why roundabouts are better, and it's got some crash information on it about uh, other roundabouts we did, and also there's a highlight on the Monroe roundabout with the video that's on our DOT website. So those tools might help you a little bit in your early conversations. Yep. Great, thank uh, you. DJ, you got a question? Go ahead. I, I yeah, and it might be kind of a dumb one, but uh, it, it uh, somebody brought up mini roundabouts before, and it got me thinking. Um, has there ever been so you know Newtown, and you know the flagpole in Newtown? Yes. <laughs> has there what? ever been? Yeah. I think you know what I'm going to ask. So Yeah, so we tried to put a single lane roundabout in there about 10 years ago. And and we worked pretty diligent on a design. And remember in my presentation, I talked about the design vehicle that you got to check. And we talked about the WB62. We talked about the bus. Those are just horizontal checks. But then we talked about that construction truck, the low boy that hauls the large construction equipment. It's got to fit under the bridges. So it's, you know, kind of dropped down. It's got limited clearance. So the Newtown site, um, that's got some grade issues with it. And, you know, when you kind of come up on the hill, um, those low boy trucks were snagging all over the place. And we, we had a lot of trouble getting that to work well with putting in raised, raised concrete islands. And we also had some right of way issues, um, trying to work with one corner there with right away to make it work. But it was really because of the topography of the site, it, it wasn't necessarily an easy spot to retrofit to a single lane, but, um, that one and the one in Goshen, we are aware of trying to modernize them and improve safety, and we are considering the mini. And, you know, I actually drove through Goshen not too long ago, and it was, it was pretty clear to me if we put in some flush splitter islands that the, the, the low boy truck can get around and, and just kind of work with what's there. I, I think we can upgrade safety significantly without spending a lot of money. And, you know, that's a lesson that I learned a couple years ago from a, a trip I made to um, Detroit. And there was a, a, a guy leading a, a regional planning, uh, a, a region out there that had built a lot of roundabouts at stop controlled intersections. And he, he went through his county, he was kind of a county engineer. And he looked at a lot of intersections that were side street stop control or always stop control. The ones that were always stop control, those are a no brainer to put in a roundabout that's going to guarantee to improve safety and guarantee to improve operation by pulling out a four-way stop and putting in a roundabout. And he wasn't necessarily getting the cross slope on the pavement all the way perfect, all the way around. He was working with the existing grades. Um, he, he didn't necessarily get them built to like a hundred percent design guideline, maybe, maybe they're 85% design guide. He did the best he could without buying right away, using the existing footprint of the road, using the existing pavement where he could, trying not to rebuild the entire drainage system. And he was able to get in quite a few roundabouts in his county to replace side street stop control and always stop control. Uh, they were huge successes, although they're not, they're not perfect. 
but they were significantly better than the stop control situation that was there before. And, you know, what he ended up with is occasional off tracking by a large vehicle because he couldn't buy the right away he needed things like that. Maybe the drainage wasn't perfect. He went for sheet flow in a few spots that maybe could have had a storm drain, but you know, he built most of these roundabouts for a half a million dollars. And, and his message to the rest of us was, you know, don't always have to achieve the stars to get great success. That's great. Thank you, Scott. All right. I think that's all the questions that we have. So again, I just want to say thank you, Scott, very much for taking your time and giving this presentation. Uh, you know, it's, it's really nice to have, you know, have you involved and communicate with everybody and, and share all your experience. Um, this was very informative, great presentation. Uh, I will have a recording of this so I can, you know, I'll reach out to everybody and follow up. Um, Banahi asked if there was a PDF. We'll see if maybe, Scott, if you could like PDF the document, if you're okay with that, the presentation. Yeah, I'll uh, see what I could do. Okay. And then, um, yeah, and we could share all that. Very yeah. good. Um, also, to let, let everyone know, Connecticut DOT is working on a roundabout corridor. We have a location in the state, state arterial, removing seven traffic signals and replacing it with six roundabouts. Yes. And that's in preliminary design now, but I'd say it's going very well and I look forward for that to happening. Um, I'm here as a resource for everybody at Connecticut DOT. Um, my email's at the top of the screen here, scott.bushy at ct.gov. My phone number's there too. I'm very comfortable with any of you reaching out to me with a question, with a phone call, email. I'm happy to talk to anybody. I am not an expert. I'm, I'm just sharing what I learned. I, so that's important to know too. I, I'm certainly not the expert here, but just a little bit of experience and sharing what I've learned to help the rest of you. There are people elsewhere in the country that have a lot more experience than I do, and they're, they're the experts. But with what I have had experience on, I'm happy to talk with you about your projects, your sites, give you advice. If you want to pull something up on a screen and look at it together, I'm more than happy to talk with you. So reach out anytime. My goal and mission is to continue the roundabout program in Connecticut and, and to do that effectively. You know, if I can get information out to you guys that help you with your project and your projects are more successful, that's going to make all of our projects more successful. So it, it's it's in our best interest to work together with this new technology we have, this, this new tool and, and help each other. And to be honest with you, that's kind of what happened with Connecticut DOT when we got involved with this. We, we, we didn't have a lot of training. We weren't experts. You know, we reached out to Howard Kilpatrick at New York DOT. Um, it was Howard McCulloch at New York DOT. Sorry, guys, I'm getting tired. But he was very, very helpful in us getting our roundabout program going. Another one was Mark Lenters. Um, he's now with Kimberly, Kimberly Horn Associates. Um, uh, of, of, you know, he did some plan reviews for us and, and helped us with our roundabout program, giving us some advice to get this going. And I'm happy to help the rest of you too with your roundabouts. Yeah, I, I, I like to add to that one uh, because, you know, the uh, the other day and it took, you know, I, I had a, I have a podcast that I just started recently and my guest was Garrett Yucalito, your deputy commissioner. So we talked there uh, of last week about all these stuff, you know, uh, the impact of the funding, positive impacts. And one of the discussion was mobility versus the intermodal planning that we have. You know, our generation has always thought only of uh, intermodal. And only lately, we are thinking about mobility, sidewalk, bicycle, si you know, roundabout, and making our communities more attractive from every point of view, every every use. So uh, the, uh, the concept, the pushing of this idea, is a great idea of the roundabouts to more audience that will listen, you know, rather than the old concept of uh, intersection improvements only. You know, I've been, uh, you know, involved in many intersection improvement projects in my career, uh, you know, minor improvement, major improvement, so on and so forth. You know, now how about the concept of uh, roundabout and, and pushing this very workable, useful concept that is coming and becoming part of the whole dialogue about mobility as a mindset, the balancing act between intermodal thinking that many in our generation have only thought about and only lately we have become sort of converts to mobility you know in the right down to the individual level 
you know, still accommodating the big trucks and all that, but about the people at the individual level. And, and that ties very well into promoting this concept of roundabout in our communities in Connecticut. I agree. Yeah. Yes, definitely. All right. Very good. Thank you, everyone, for Thank you. You know, participating. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Okay, bye bye. Thank you, Scott. Yep, I'll I'll work on getting the PDF package over to you, Eric. Okay, that'd be great. Okay. Hey, thanks for having me, and uh, nice talk with you guys. Yeah, thanks a lot. Take care, everyone.